actually working in that side of the building or what have you. But um, but that green roofed structure is really just to protect people from uh, as they walk by on the sidewalk from getting hit from anything from above. So investigators, once, of course, they determine that there's no one under this pile of debris here, um, the next thing they're going to do is assess the structural stability of the building. That will be up to the Department of Buildings. Um, and then, of course, then they'll be able to, um, you know, get traffic moving and things like that around there. But right now, we don't know how unstable this portion of the building is. It is a corner. And, again, it's a low-bearing exterior wall here that we're looking at. Given um, the damage that we see here uh, on this video, I mean, and your experience in knowing structures, how they work, how they hold up, how they eventually collapse, would there have been warning signs? Would there have been like a rumble? Would there have been pieces of this that fell off that you think maybe some people would have had a warning or does this just happen all at once? Uh, I'm pretty sure this all was one, one entire collapse kind of happening in a very short period of time. And we've had obviously very high winds for the last day or so and that may have played a role here in one way or another, we just don't know. You notice on sort of the upper portion of the building that the floors actually are missing because they're on the ground now. Some of the floors are still hanging off, like cantilevered off the edge of the floor. So um, so this is, like I said, this will take some time to figure out what happened here. Um, you know, but in my mind, this, is, this, was, this was a, a sustained collapse that occurred over a very short period of time. Perhaps it was what we call a progressive collapse or one area starts to fall and then it basically pancakes all the way down to the ground. When so, you say period of time, what, what kind of period of time would that look like? Uh, just a, a seconds, really. I mean, this whole thing probably was over in about 10 seconds. So, But what precipitated, what caused it, that's going to be in question right now. Because I, I can't see a lot from just when it's one corner here. But, um, but again, it, it looks like, you know, perhaps there was something going on there um, that I'm not seeing, you know, in the debris pile. But but obviously, like I said, this was this was a complete collapse of that entire portion of the corner of the building there. And which course, is which is really striking. We're looking at a side and end of a building to just almost be shorn off, right? Usually, right. not usually, right. but often when these happen, you see the whole building come down. To see a portion right. of it just sliced off almost and come down right. like that is really, really striking. Right. So that portion of the building was destabilized for some reason. Um, there's nothing right now I can see here that's going to tell us why, but um, but again, it's it's you know it, it it also indicates that the rest of the building, of course, is going to have to be and they're, they're going to be looked at, and of course they're probably just going to evacuate and keep people out of this until they get a, a complete structural assessment of how this happened, what what caused it to happen, and what other portions of the building are destabilized now because you're missing the corner walls here. You mentioned that wind um, could be a factor in this collapse. Can you explain why? Sure. Well, wind is, is a force, right? It's, I mean, if anyone's standing, you know, in midtown Manhattan during a windy day and their, their, their umbrella goes upside down and things and they can feel almost like something pushing on them, well, wind does the same thing to buildings. And so there's really good possibility that there may have just been enough uh, of uh, of the wind in a particular moment in time where, again, if there was a destabilized portion of the building, an, un an unstable area, that, in fact, that may have precipitated this. But that's one factor in many. Um, you know, this could also happen, and I don't think this is what happened here, but, uh, you know, we've seen in over the years in the city here where, um, you know, vehicles have, have, have gone into buildings, basically, and, um, and impacted them and then caused port partial collapses, which is possible here. I don't think so, but it's, it's certainly possible. There's no nothing indicating that right now. But those are all, again, uh, these are all a list of factors that, um, you know, the immediate need, of course, is to rescue anybody who's trapped in that pile, get everybody else out of the building, um, and then, then they can start looking about stabilizing the remainder of the building and then, of course, eventually figure out, like, how did this happen and why? I'm guessing you don't have any insight as to what work was going on at the building prior to today, correct? No, just the fact that that's that, that sh sh what we call the sidewalk shed, that green sort of covered roof structure there. That's, right. that is, that's not the scaffolding the, that the workers would work on to actually do repair work. For example, in a building like this, this is a brick 
low bearing exterior wall, meaning that these, you know, you can see that there's missing a couple floor at the very top is completely gone, or it's actually on the floor below there I'm seeing now. Um, that a brick wall like this does require, you know, maintenance. This building's probably 100, at least 100 years old, and it requires maintenance, you know, with the weather and everything that wears out all the mortar, the cement basically between the bricks. And again, that can lead to situations where the wall is destabilized as a whole, or even just just portions of the wall actually uh, may be destabilized. And that's why I'm saying that the shed is that green roofed structure there is solely to protect people walking on that sidewalk in front if a bridge should fall off or something else. It's going to strike that and not the people. But that's not the scaffolding that would be used perhaps for. Um, you know, for actual uh, work and stuff like that. So just to um, clarify, I, I just want to make sure, because this is a really important point that we're talking about right here. I just yeah. want to clarify the fact that they have this shed structure that you're talking about, the green portion yeah. that we're seeing here on the video, tells right. you that there was debris falling or could have fallen from this building. Yeah, they're in, they're, they're, that's usually the reason they're there. They're also put up when work actually will be conducted to make sure that if workers are up on the face of the building doing work and stuff, that that, that protection still be in place. But the fact that it's there indicates that in all likelihood uh, they were concerned about things falling down. I can't see on the other side. From, uh, there may be, I think there is actually, now I can see in the video, uh, sort of the base of the building going the other direction. I wonder if there's a sidewalk shed there as well. So uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, we'll find out. I mean, there's a lot of metal debris in this pile, which is not something I would expect to find. I can't see that it's actually scaffolding underneath the ladder truck there. It's possible. I mean, I see some, some things that might indicate that's what it was, and perhaps there was some scaffolding in the corner of this building. I don't know. Um, we'll find out, of course. The other thing to point out here is that I see like there's this metal chain link fence in front of the on the other side of the street, of course, and I don't know if that had anything to do with this, if there was some kind of, again, construction work or concern about it, but, um, but we're only getting a very small sort of limited view of kind of what's, what's happening here. Right. When, when it comes to scaffolding around the city, it's kind of a bane of people's existence to deal with this stuff um, that's up. It's unsightly. It's there for so long. But in this case, you're saying it appears it was in response or there to handle real work that was at least... Um, begun or at least recognized as something to to work on yeah it's very possible we just don't know I mean I like I said it's hard to tell from this this short video here exactly what's going on around the site things but but it's clear that like I said the reason you put the shed up is because of falling debris uh, perhaps they've already had some problems of bricks or other portions of the building coming down smaller pieces um, and that's why they erected that shed um, what's interesting is that I'm, you know, like I'm looking at it again. The, the corner actually, you can notice that there's that it's sort of missing at that point. This would have had to have been carried around to the other side. I'm wondering. I guess what I'm seeing on the ground then is probably the remnants of the, perhaps of the other piece of the shed that may have been up against the one that's still standing there. So, but like I said, the main thing is to make sure that right now the biggest important thing is make sure that there's no known victims underneath this debris pile here, that there's no people still uh, trapped in their apartments. That does happen from time to time where people um, are trapped in a portion of an apartment that can't get out. I doubt that's the case here, but the fire department's got to get access to the building, go through every floor, basically clear everybody out because we just don't know how unstable the rest of the building is right now just looking at it. Yeah, we're really literally looking into the cutaway of certain people's apartments there, just ripped open uh, for the world to see. Talk about, if you can, the, the, the process, the painstaking process of trying to find people in that rubble. That is, that looks like a really, really tough, challenging situation. It will, and it, it turns out that the uh, FDNY has, of course, as it does in many respects, has one of the top rescue units in the country, and the collapse rescue units have to be based in the Bronx. So they'll be on scene there. They'll be assessing what they find, you know, what's what's underneath the pile there. They're going to be asking, I, there's probably someone there around that building that saw it, like turn, heard it and turned around and saw it go down. They're going to ask them, did they see anybody walking by or what have you before that happened? So they're trying to get an idea of what's the likelihood of somebody being under that pile. I think one of the, perhaps one of the, uh, nothing's good in this situation, but one of the, 
instances here is that um, it's a relatively small debris pile. And from what I can tell here, it's, it's not like in a lot of collapses, you get a situation where the debris pile actually stabilizes the rest of the building. Um, and I don't think that's the case here. So I, as far as I could tell, but I'm sure the, that the rescue company three that's there in the Bronx who has a collapse rescue unit, all truck devoted to this kind of situation. They're trying to go through all the information to figure out what's the likelihood there. And if they can't directly access it because of the stability that that debris above, because those floors that we're looking at right now that are leaning and stuff, those could easily fall down while they're trying to remove people underneath there. So typically what the fire department does is, is when they arrive on the scene, this tower ladder uh, is probably the first new ladder company that's there. They're gonna they're trained to look for any surface victims, we call them. People who are, it's obvious that they're trapped where you can see them and they'll get them out of the way immediately, basically. It's dangerous, but they'll, you know, they'll, they'll basically remove those people. It's the ones that we perhaps can't see, and we don't know there's anyone under here. They just have to be basically a situation where they're gonna decide how to access that area underneath. Uh, they may bring them some additional heavy equipment to move some of it away, and then basically get down in there. Because I, I, I'm almost sure that up in that tower ladder, they're looking down, they keep, they're looking down on top of that pile just to see if they can see anyone that might be under, again, under this debris pile. Well, like so many um, apartment buildings here in the city, Professor, a lot of them are built on top of businesses. And according to some of the maps that we've been looking up um, online here at last check, there did seem to be a deli, a bodega mini mart type of business that is open there um, at that corner. Here is another look at uh, some video just coming into our newsroom of a different angle. You can tell there that it's further across the street um, where it's just giving us another view of the damage and um, the facade, how much of that facade actually just crumbled there to the ground. And as we continue to observe this video, back to my point, Professor, um, so many businesses underneath these apartment complexes and at last checked it does look as though that there was a business underneath there um, in this particular section. Again, we do not know of any injuries whatsoever, but you know, getting back to your point about how quickly this collapse may have happened, you know, my heart just sank when you said it was probably just a matter um, of seconds before all of this debris came tumbling down, particularly with the commercial um, buildings underneath there. Right. And you know, the fire department obviously, is, you know, New York City is, is the top-notch rescue companies, as I said earlier. And, you know, they've had situations like this many times before. And what they're going to end up doing is if they're evacuating the rest of the building, basically. They're going to, they're going to, if there is a bodega there, which we believe there is in that corner, what they may have to do is actually uh, access that from the walls inside the apartment building itself, right? So there's an adjacent apartment next to the... Uh, so that you know, oh, we're seeing a, in the video for the viewers is a drone up there, which is which is a new, obviously a new technology the fire department is using uh, for for this kind of situation to get an aerial view of what's happening. So they'll access that bodega perhaps from another side, from inside the building, from another wall, basically to see to make sure there's nobody that might be trapped in there who couldn't get out. Um, you know, I, I, again, if it's in the corner there, then they probably did not have access to get out of the building, and they may actually still be inside the store and the remaining portion of that if in fact there's a, again a bodega on the corner just can't tell at this point professor the initial video we were looking at and see right here it makes it right. appear that it's the end of a building right the right, other the, the corner, new video yeah. now shows that it's in fact the corner a yeah, corner, corner just yeah, fell corner. down have you yeah, seen that right. before and and that just looks so striking to me at least what, what do you make of that well again you know i i i because I, I, I don't know all the facts here at this point, but I, I can see how wind wind is affected by you know the face of a building, but more importantly, in the corners of buildings are points where wind can play some some important roles in in sort of moving across the building and stuff. So it's possible that had something to do with it. Again, I don't know, but but it is definitely the corner, um, and you know we'll find out. Um, this appears to me is if you can see on the top floor, the floor is still intact there. So this was an exterior wall collapse, right? So this is what 
the wall started coming down and it pulled some of the floors down with it. That's I think that's pretty clear at this point. Hmm. Um, so the wall would have been falling. Again, we don't know why. Um, was it rain, all the rain that we had in the last day? There may have been, again, destabilizing part of the wall. Was it a rain and wind, perhaps? But in any case, it looks like the exterior wall came down and literally the floors came with them. So some of the floors are still sort of hanging on. Some are down below. But that looks to me like what happened here. Latest update from the FDNY is that there have been no injuries that they can report at this point in time. I, I just wonder why we haven't seen this before or we don't see this more often because, I, I don't know, we're talking about older buildings, older city, so many of them built at the same time roughly, right? 100 years right. ago or so. Um, right. This is really something to see and, and we don't see it that often. No, no, we're fortunate we don't see that that often. That's why I mean, New York City has a, one, of the, one of the only cities in the country is a very unique uh, facade inspection program where older buildings are required to be inspected on a periodic basis to verify that the facade, in this case, I mean, facade implies, you know, is a specific word that, apply, you know, means something that's been put on the outside. But facade also includes these situations like this where it's not just the face of the building, but it's a load-carrying face of the building. So it's a brick wall that holds up that portion of the building, basically. So that's why these inspections are, are so important. I would hope to think that the fact that the city is doing them maybe has prevented some of these things from happening. Sometimes they're simply decorations. Of some, you might remember years ago that a, um, uh, an architect was walking down, I forgot, somewhere in midtown and was struck by a piece of of, of uh, the building decorations coming off the front face of the building so we're in an old city where this stuff can happen and so we've got to be more proactive about inspecting these buildings and looking for uh, a variety of things looking for walls that are missing mortar obviously things you know walls that um, are not completely stable because the, the cement between the bricks has been worn away over a hundred years uh, we have to look for bulging walls, walls that are, are not uh, plumb, that are not straight up and down. They're, these are all things that, that when they do an inspection, are looking for instability, um, you know, in, in these kind of buildings. So that's why it's so important. And it doesn't happen that often, but the potential is always there for something like this because I don't know that we're keeping up with a lot of this because these buildings are, in fact, so old in portions of the city. So, Which is a little unnerving. It is. It <laughs> is. And, you know, it, it makes us think about how important, you know, these kind of regulations are. I mean, we, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't like the, the sheds. And I agree. I mean, uh, you know, I, I teach on 59th Street right around the corner from your studio. And a lot of the buildings around there have had scaffolding for a very long time. And they're unsightly and whatever. But... The thing is, is that they are incredibly important, though, in situations like this, um, because this obviously is a much more major collapse than the whole portion of the building went down. But it's not a situation where, again, which is perhaps even more common, is where you get older buildings where we know there's issues that we have smaller pieces of, of debris mm -hmm. like that ornamentation that hit that uh, well-known architect several years ago in Midtown and killed her. So that's the kind of reasons why this is important. So the reason why doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, do the work more quickly. And I think that's another issue. These scaffolding stay up for so long, and um, it is a protection means, but it means that we're delaying getting access to actually repairing, or not access, but repairing these walls when needed. Professor, I'm so, just going to interrupt you very quickly yeah. because we did um, have a reporter, Jenna DeAngelis, just arrive at the scene. So if you don't mind just standing by, sure. waiting there on the phone, because I'm sure we're going to go back to you. In the meantime, let's go now live to the scene. Jenna DeAngelis there. She just arrived. Jenna, what have you been able to find out so far? Well, Christina Maurice, we just got here. I can tell you this is a massive scene. It spans several blocks with the FDNY and NYPD. I want to give you a look at the building here behind me. Again, this is on West Burnside Avenue near Osborne Place. Now, you can see this appears to be the end of a building. It just looks like it's sort of uh, collapsed downward, and um, there is some scaffolding in the area here. Now, the FDNY says so far no reports of injuries, but obviously the building has collapsed, so they do have to do a search here. Again, the FDNY and NYPD are 
on are on scene. They say the call came in around 3:30 this afternoon to 172 West Burnside Avenue. Now, according to the Department of Buildings website, there is one active complaint dated October 6th. It noted an inspector was unable to gain access to conduct inspection. Uh, we did reach out to the DOB to learn more there, but again, you can see just the extensive damage to this building, and then um, straight up above, you can see what appears to be the FDNY sort of uh, inspecting the building here. So again, we just got on scene here, so we're going to gather more information, talk to some people in the area, see what we can find out, and of course, we are going to bring you another update. But for now, we are live in the Morris Heights section of the Bronx. Jenna DeAngelis, CBS 2 News. Jenna, before we let you go, we know you just got there, but just your own observations. We, we don't see this every day. This is a really striking image. What do you make of what you see, what people, how people are reacting as best you can tell? Again, you just got there a few seconds ago. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we don't see this every day. I mean, just being here in person and taking a look at this building, it's quite shocking to see. And uh, there's people standing by with their cell phones. I mean, I'm looking across at neighbors right now, and they look like they're in disbelief. So um, definitely a shocking scene with uh, a really great presence, a great response here. Um, it looks like the uh, NYPD also has a, a drone up here um, to try, I guess, to get a scope of um, what's happening here. But um, I think, Maurice, you mentioned this earlier. Earlier. It just, it, 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 it's like a bizarre scene. It looks like the, the corner of the building just sort of collapsed downward. Um, and, and, and you can just sort of see into this just one part of the building. But uh, again, I think the best way to describe this is shocking. And uh, just looking at people's faces here, that's sort of um, what I'm getting from people here. But I'm going to talk to some people, see if they can give us an indication of anything they saw. And then, of course, I'll report back to you. Jenna, if you can just stand by for one moment, I'd like to direct your photographer if he could or she could please zoom over back to the collapse area. Um, if we can get some tight, those tight shots that we had earlier, you can see that these were people's bedrooms at the very top floor there that hasn't been collapsed. Yeah. If it could pan up there, we actually see a bed. So clearly that was someone's bedroom. And then so these are personal spaces, personal living spaces for these people that lived in these units that are now affected here. It, it's just it's mind blowing and heartbreaking all at the same time. Life totally abruptly exactly. interrupted like that, right? Exactly. All right, okay. Jenna, thank you. Great work there. We're going to let you get to work along with your photographers and crews there as the FDNY continues to do their work as well. If you are just joining us, uh, we are interrupting with breaking news happening in um, the Bronx right now, specifically the Morris Heights section at 172 West Burnside Avenue. You can see by these pictures the destruction that took place here this afternoon. Right now, the FDNY is telling us that there are no injuries that they know of so far. Clearly, a search for any possible victims is still going on as we speak. A shocking scene to anyone looking at these images. CBS 2's Tim McNicholas has been looking into the nature of the building, its history in terms of violations, inspections, and so forth. Tim, what have you learned? Oh, Christina Maurice, we have learned there have been some recent inspections at this property, and there are also some open violations, seven open violations, according to the Department of Buildings records. We're still looking through all those, but I want to read you one recent violation notice. This is from November of this year. An inspector wrote, I observe there are deteriorated, deteriorated and broken mud sills with inadequate support for vertical members throughout. It goes on to say there is one vertical member with missing mud sill, a missing mud sill, which can compromise the structural stability, causing a potential collapse, injuring pedestrians or damaging property. Now, this is a large property. We don't know what part of the property that violation applies to or whether it was for the building itself or perhaps the sidewalk shed. These are all questions that we're looking into and the Department of Buildings also looking into them. And we don't know if those problems were fixed, but the violation is still listed as open with, quote, no compliance recorded. The records also indicate that there has been some construction of the property recently. We know that because some of the open violations, including that one I just mentioned, is categorized as a construction violation. Christina Morris. Mention when those violations were issued. If you did, I'm sorry, I just didn't catch it. So that one that I, I read through, that was in November of this year. Okay. There's others as well. There's an open violation from 2020. It looks like there's another one from 2021. Still looking through all that, but that one that I just read you, about the missing mud sill that was from November of this year. Okay, Tim McNicholas, thank you. We'll let you get back to it. There's much more to come on that.
uh, on that front. But uh, there are it, there are violations, open violations that have been uh, discussed and at least uh, looked into. So once again, we are looking at a really just striking scene here in Morris Heights in the Bronx, 172 Burnside Avenue, the corner of a large building, apartment building that looks at least to be six stories tall, just collapsed spontaneously within a few seconds coming down this afternoon onto the street. Uh, FDNY is on the scene right now. You see the ladder, you see uh, the bucket, you see them there trying to find uh, people, any survivors here. There's also an FDNY drone to give them imagery of the scene to try to find any survivors. Um, but so far there are no reports of any injuries uh, at this point. But uh, there you see the scene. People, uh, our reporter on the scene, Jenna DeAngelo, is telling us that everyone pretty much shocked at, at what has happened here. And, and at this point, we're, it's really speculation as to why this came down in this, in this fashion. Um, but that, that remains to be seen right now. But there you see the, the interruption, the abrupt, sudden interruption to people's lives. You're seeing into a bedroom. You're seeing the pancaking of a floor beneath that to another floor. And, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's where we are. It's shocking. It's, right. just, it's really, it's shocking. And I'm sure for the people that call this neighborhood home, a street and um, neighborhood that they're all familiar with, this is something that they obviously did not expect. And this is something that is just um, sending shockwaves throughout that entire neighborhood. We do have Jenna DeAngelis at the scene. Let's go back to her now with some new information. Jenna? Well, Christina, after you pointed out the bed on the top floor, I had a moment to sort of step back and take a look at what's here. And as you said, these are people's homes. I mean, I see on what looks like to be the fourth floor down, there looks to be a child's coat hanging there. If you if you go down a little more, it looks like I'm seeing inside someone's closet, um, appliances. So it, it really drives home um, the shock of this all. I mean, people live here and just watching their home sort of collapse is, um, it's devastating for, for me to see. I mean, as you mentioned, the FDNY said no reports of injury so far. Um, this is a building collapse, so they do have to do a search. Um, I want to pan over there's uh, an FDNY drone, as you mentioned here, uh, getting a, another set of eyes over the uh, the damage here. And this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is um, a scene that spans several blocks. Uh, everywhere I look, I see a FDNY ladder truck and the NYPD. Uh, again, this is West Burnside Avenue. The actual address is 172 West Burnside Avenue. And the call came in around 3.30 this afternoon. So they've been out here for a little over an hour now. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what caused this. Um, and I think the thing that shocks me standing here is just how you can see it's just this one part of the building, just the corner of this building. And around it, there is scaffolding. So so that, that's an indication that there um, was some sort of work going on here or inspection of some sort going on here. Uh, but again, I think uh, as we learn more information out here and begin to talk to people, I think just taking a step back and sort of seeing that these are people's homes um, is really quite shocking. So uh, again, only got out here about a half hour ago. So going to work on talking to people, seeing if we can get more information out here. And uh, we'll come back to you with another update. Again, this is the Morris Heights section of the Bronx. I'll send it back to you in the studio. Best you can tell, Jenna, this is a residential building. Six, I believe, maybe seven stories. We can't tell from here. Maybe you can. But what about on the ground floor? We understand there might be uh, businesses, a bodega or two of something of that nature. Can you tell at this point? So I don't know if you can see from where I am, but I'm sort of blocked off by uh, what appears to be like a, a gated uh, area here. There must have been some road work going on. I believe I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stories at least. And I do see uh, a yellow awning that says sandwiches. So uh, it looks like there was a bodega down there. But I'm, I'm a little bit cut off where I'm standing right now. Um, across the street is a, is a laundromat here. And of course, a lot of residential here. There's a lot of apartments here. So uh, a lot of people who live here that are standing by taking this all in, have their cell phones out, and sort of just in shock. Have you been able to observe at all anyone nearby that may be looking for family or maybe in that area um, wondering if their family is okay? Any chatter about that surrounding you so far? We're across the street. The uh, FDNY and the NYPD have us sort of taped off across the street, so I'm not able to get close enough to the building to see if there are people looking for anyone. Oops, so, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, right now what I can see is just the uh, FDNY ladder trucks, and it looks like a, and a cherry picker all the way up at the top with a flashlight 
um, trying to get a look in there. But I definitely will start talking to people out here and just see what I can uh, learn from people who live here. Obviously, these are people's homes. Hey, Jenna DeAngelis, we'll let you go track down some more information. We appreciate it. Let's go back to the phone right now. Professor Glenn For uh, Corbett, uh, Professor of Fire Sciences at John Jay. You've been watching us this, this afternoon with us. Um, what do you make of what you see now? Night is falling. Firefighters are up against even more now, more elements as the night gets cooler, and uh, they look for people. Right, and um, you see a little bit more now with the, the newer videos. Um, we see that green uh, fencing around the building, which would indicate there's some kind of construction going on here. There's also a piece of heavy equipment. Um, you could see the portion of it um, yellow uh, heavy equipment there in the foreground behind that green fence. So it's possible something else was going on in the street. I mean, I think earlier one of your reporter mentioned about construction and things. Um, that's a possibility, too, here, that there may have been some construction work going on even in the street in front of this building that may have done something. So, But for right now, you know, the most important thing is to make sure that no one is, in fact, in that pile. Um, some of the other video I've seen Looks like some of the firefighters are actually much closer now um, to uh, accessing that pile. So uh, the, as it gets dark now, of course, they're going to have to set up lighting and stuff just to, to, to maintain some level of, uh, of um, under, uh, understanding of any movement of the building. That's what these tower ladders are looking in different windows you can see in the video here. It's just making, I guess, making sure no one's in there. But they're also looking to make sure there's no movement of any of this other remaining sort of hanging uh, floor floors that are uh, still there intact, and including the one at the very top. So, um, so yeah, these are all. This is this is going to make it more difficult, you know, at night and stuff. Um, but you know, we'll have to see again where, if in fact anyone has been, been determined to perhaps be trapped here, and how they're going to access them um, through the outside or. If, or if, again, we mentioned earlier about the bodega, if there's any people in, mm. any people in the store. So many, here you know, Professor, real quick, so many different factors to consider here. And according to our reporting, Tim McNicholas, um, I don't know if you heard him, if you were able to hear his report, but he did mention seven open violations, the latest being issued in November um, of this year. And he mentioned um, something about broken mud sills. What does you that know. mean to you? Well, it, it's... There, there's, it's pretty clear if there's that many violations that, that the city's been watching this building, basically, um, and was concerned enough about it to write these violations, obviously, if, if they're there. And um, so the mud sill issue could have played a role here. I mean, I, again, it's, it, it all depends on, on, again, where this exactly, where the collapse started. And I think, it, again, from my perspective, it's pretty clear that the the wall that moved first and pulled these floors down with them um, as it went down. So, um, but again, everything would point, of course, for the most part, uh, to, you know, to somewhere, um, you know, perhaps even at the lowest portion of the building where that all started. And again, w there's so many factors here that could come up that actually precipitated this happening. For those who don't so know what a mud sill is, can you, can you just kind of flesh that out for us? Yeah, let me just mention real quick. You can see the um, the drone that's that's actually now on on screen right now. That um, is um, that's they're using that to watch the stability of the building, basically, um, and are using that to to uh, you know there's a, obviously there's a camera the camera on the drone, and then there's a screen down below, um, you know, and basically uh you know again transmitting images and stuff so they just want to make sure there's no movement there as far as the mud seal goes i mean that's at the base of the building so again it, it's basically it's just it's just a it's a structural element of the building at the lowest portion of it um which kind of makes sense if that was deteriorated uh particularly if it was wood um you know that maybe they cited this and that might be one of the reasons that it happened it may not be the sole reason again there may be other things that are happening the construction the wind rain whatever that sort of pushed this over the edge in terms of collapse so well the reporting um, the report that uh, was filed the inspector wrote that 
you know, this uh, one vertical member with missing mud sill, which can compromise the structural stability, causing a potential that, collapse, injuring pedestrians and damaging property. That's what the inspector wrote in and November. That, that may be, you know, that, that probably rises very high to the list of what happened here. You know, that they, the, the DOB, did, the Department of Buildings actually did spot a problem like this. Um, it's you also know, unclear and, and what section of the building they were referring to. We have to at least right. Uh, point that out. Right, we don't know that yet. But, I mean, it's very possible that's linked to what's going on here, particularly, and it, it wasn't even just the mud slice, as a, and it mentioned in the report, which I don't have, it said, you said that it also called a missing vertical element, too, correct? Right, correct. Yeah, so, so that may be a role here, you know, maybe part of what happened here. Um, but, like I said, we, when we were talking earlier, it was kind of hard to see things, but now it looks like this building is under some kind of, of construction work. I mean, the fact there's a, there's a, a green, uh, you know, green uh, fence around the entire site. I mean, it also could be that there's work out in the street here too. And I don't know if I heard that. Did one of the reporters mention that? Somebody said about street work here. She uh, mentioned that there's that way. Yeah, right. she mentioned that there's partitions um, around that area that that may indicate that there was street work, but we do not have that confirmed. Yeah. You know, and so what will happen here is. You know, after everything's, after everyone's been recovered, you know, found, and hopefully everybody walked away uh, uninjured with this situation. Of course, you know, as we said earlier, the, the first issue will be to, to stabilize the remaining portion of the building if they can. Um, and then, of course, when the investigation starts, um, then they'll look at all these different factors and figure out which one of these is the one that actually cause the cause the collapse to commence basically and what are the uh, how did the other situations the other um issues sort of play a role in this whole and thing, our, our photographer know? on the scene there giving us an image a close-up image a second ago of what looks like a small coat probably a child's coat um a life so abruptly and rudely interrupted there just in a devastating way you know i was going to pretty... ask you huh yeah you know, I was going to say it's pretty remarkable thinking about there's a young child that probably lived in that room there. Right. It's pretty remarkable that no one said at this point that that someone, you know, basically had fallen out of that, that floor. Obviously, one of the floors is completely missing. The others are slanted. And, and you know, can you imagine if there was a child in that room, they would have ended up, you know, going down with the wall, basically. So we're hoping that wasn't the case here. But um, but that's, of course, again, what the fire department's looking for. And, you know, they've, they've dealt with lots of collapses in the past, and they'll get, you know, hopefully get as close as they can to, the, to see if, in fact, there are anybody, is anyone there. You can only hope people were not home at that yeah. hour. Um, right. one, one other thing you pointed out, there was a yellow, heavy piece of construction equipment uh, in the street, or at least outside the building. I'm wondering how do you think that could potentially precipitate something like this or lead to it, you know, with vibrations, with contact? What, what would that look like? Sure, and that's, uh, we don't know, exa it's, it's certainly not, you know, it's not a bucket loader or something like, it's hard to tell because you only see the very top of it, basically, there's, there's, you know, there's an arm on it, I don't know if, exactly what it is, but the issue is that even if it was simply construction work in the street, like, for example, opening the street up for utilities and things, you know, you, you're basically, um, you know, creating a situation where all those, as you just mentioned, all the vibrations from that equipment can be basically uh, sent over to the building received by the building and maybe uh, again push the building over the edge you know if it was that close to a failure to begin with so that's why when you have you know a building like this that's unstable one of the hardest things to do um you know is to determine exactly when you know a building needs to be evacuated for example and the fact that the re the building inspector wrote the report the way he did it was you know from what you read earlier it's pretty clear that at least that inspector believed that this was a significant hazard. And then the question becomes, should this building have been vacated for that reason? Meaning that yeah. basically the building be evacuated because of that kind of problem. Yeah, that um, was going to be my next question to you is yeah. if, it was, if it's that serious of an issue, 
um, we've got to look at the question of, you know, why didn't they um, evacuate the building if, if there was that much of a danger that was posed. I did want to just add that some new information coming into our newsroom is that the FDNY says this is, in fact, a seven-story building. The main floor, the ground level, is a business. They do have dogs on top of the rubble searching for anyone. And, of course, you also mentioned, um, Professor Corbett, the drone that they also have up in the air. And we can clearly see by these pictures um, from our live camera there at the scene that uh, they do have the ladder trucks up searching and assessing the uh, structural damage and also just whether um, or not they need to um, um, do some support and uh, see if the rest of this building is also in danger of collapsing. Earlier, you mentioned that um, one of the top collapse units is actually based in the Bronx, Professor. Can, can you just give us some more specifics about how the um, FDNY specializes um, in this department? Yeah, well, the FDNY, like I said, is one of the oldest fire departments in the country and has developed a lot of expertise, training equipment, and things like that. So the collapse rescue unit, Rescue 3, um, is an elite unit that deals with these kind of situations. It's been around for decades. And what it entails is basically the, the rescue companies in the fire department are the sort of the elite companies. They are the highest trained companies in the city. Um, and they each have their own specialties. And what just happens at the Bronx, they do specifically specialize in building collapse. And so what that means is they have the expertise, meaning they drill and train all the time on understanding how to rescue people from a building like this that's been destabilized that basically it's a danger to the firefighters mm -hmm. to try to get in there to this pile to find people so they develop systems uh, and protocols and equipment to do that so we mentioned the drone earlier i would bet that the uh, robotic dog now the fire department has the two of them will probably be deployed here perhaps on the inside of the building uh, particularly for that bodega um, if, in fact, they can't get access, if there is, again, well, I'm just, we're all guessing into the bodega on the corner there, but uh, a business there, but they would access it from inside the building, and that's the perfect place to send the dog in uh, to, as it gets closer to the collapse here on the outside of the building, to try to see if, in fact, there's any victims that may still be trapped in there. But their, their trucks and their equipment are all, again, set up for this kind of situation. So they've got everything from transits that are used by um, by surveyors to, to watch for building movement. They've got all sorts of shoring equipment to stabilize things so they can get in there and, and actually get closer to the building and do what they need to do. Um, they've got all sorts of detection devices looking for any kind of gas collection stuff. If there was a gas leak, that's a potential to happen here too because they've sheared off some gas lines. I mean, there's all sorts of different tools that they carry on these very large trucks and it just happens that it's based there in the Bronx so uh, they'll be on you know they'll be using probably a lot of those things today and tonight just to make sure that again at the end of the day that if there is in fact anybody trapped that they'll they'll get you know take care of those folks and stuff thank so thankfully um, we've, we've got the right yeah. team there on the ground professor we cannot thank you enough for your insight tonight has been spot on and excellent and we really appreciate the insight we're going to take our viewers here into Thank the you. five o'clock news as we continue to watch the scene 172 west burnside avenue morris heights in the bronx a building as you can see there the corner of it just coming down raining down onto the streets without warning interrupting lives basically terrifying the neighborhood and the search is on for people for survivors as we looked at lives abruptly interrupted right there uh, in Morris Heights. Our, our reporters are there on the scene. FDNY has a drone up above, and uh, we've got every angle of this thing covered, but uh, really striking images this afternoon. It really has been shocking to see, but again, if we can just stress right now, <laughs> The silver lining in this, the FDNY is saying no reports of any injuries that we can tell at this time at this 5 o'clock hour. And right now at 5, we will continue to follow this breaking news of that partial collapse building in the Bronx. Part of that building in Morris Heights has crumbled to the ground, but right now FDNY, again, not reporting any in, uh, injuries. Good evening once again. I'm Maurice Dubois. And I'm Christine Johnson. So these pictures that are coming out of the Morris Heights area are just really incredible. We've been watching all of this unfold here in the past hour. 
power. And the crews right now are digging through the rubble to investigate how this happened. Let's get right to the ground. CBS 2's Jenna DeAngelis on the scene with the very latest for us right now. Jenna, what do you see? Marisa Christine, it's a completely different feel when you're out here looking at it. I mean, it's just completely devastating. You pointed out this this out earlier, but if you look at the building all the way up top, you can see someone's bed. And as you scan down the building, you see the inside of people's homes. I see a what looks like a child's coat in a closet, appliances. It's just devastating. And you just watch if, when you look at this building. It's just the corner of the building that it looks like just came sort of straight down. Below it is rubble. And earlier we saw what. Appeared to be the NYPD with a dog looking through the rubble. As you mentioned, the FDNY has reported no injuries so far, but they are still scanning um, the destruction here. To give you an idea, again, this is 172 West Burnside Avenue. It's a building that is six floors of what appears to be apartments, and then the seventh floor, the main floor, is businesses. Um, we're being kept back a little bit from the NYPD and FDNY, which are on scene, but they have eyes all over this. They have the uh, FDNY drone up ahead, uh, a firefighter on, firefighters on cherry pickers above, scanning the building with flashlights, and uh, it's a massive scene that that spans blocks. So they were called to this at 3.30 this afternoon. Again, 172 West Burnside Avenue. So far, no reports of injuries. I did talk to some people out here trying to get an idea of uh, what's happening here. And so far, everyone we spoke to were just neighbors that either saw this on the news or heard about it and came out here to see what is going on. So we're continuing to learn more information here. But again, 172 West Burnside Avenue, a massive scene here. And the FDNY trying to get to and the NYPD trying to get to the bottom of exactly what happened here. For now, we are live in the Morris Heights section of the Bronx. Jenna DeAngelis, CBS 2 News. All right, Jenna, thank you for that report. We want to get to Fire Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh now. She joins us on the phone to give us some more information about what is happening on Burnside Avenue. Commissioner, thank you for joining us. Um, can you please just tell us what is the latest from the scene? Are you hearing reports of anyone? One that might be trapped under that rubble or even in the building? Yeah, so this is the latest. You know, first and foremost, I want to emphasize this is a live scene. You know, we have our firefighters, our EMTs, and our medics through this rubble using our canine unit and locate anyone that could be under that. Um, we will presume with, with an occupied building that there could be someone there until we eliminate that possibility. So right now for us, we know that there was a major collapse. Uh, we know that there could be someone under there, although we haven't confirmed that. And we are doing everything in our power to make sure we can find them if they're there or to eliminate the possibility. Commissioner, can you describe what you're up against? I mean, we see it, but in, in terms of your expertise and how your, your crews go about their business here, what, what does it look like? You know, I would say this came in as a 1060, and what that means for the fire department is a serious collapse. And so we're taking it accordingly, you know, because our mission is life until we confirm that some, a place like this was not occupied, we're gonna go to work. Um, so given that this is an active building, a building with commercial space and residential space, we're gonna presume there could be someone there and we're gonna operate like there, there is. Commissioner, are there any evacuations happening in and around this area? Um, so just in order to stay clear, obviously the building itself uh, is evacuated, but otherwise we're just asking residents to stay clear. As I said, this is an active scene and we wanna let the first responders go to work. At this point, you're obviously laser focused on finding people, but do you have any idea what could have happened here? We don't. Um, the DOB commissioner and his team are on scene, so when we are done with our search and rescue, uh, they will take over the investigation. Commissioner, can you tell us whether or not there was any road construction in this area going on? So I cannot. That'll be part of the investigation. You know, like I said, we're solely focused on making sure that we're finding any victims that could be there. Um, once we have completed our operation, a full investigation will take place. And one more thing here, Commissioner. We understand that you have an elite unit, well-trained, highly specialized in this kind of thing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yes, so we have a number of specialized units. Um, our members actually drill and train on this regularly. We actually have a rubble pile at our academy for this very reason. Um, so we have a number of members that are specially trained in exactly this search and rescue in a collapse, search and rescue using canines, and for our EMTs and medics, for treating people even in the collapse or as soon as they get out. So this is something 
we train for regularly. We have our best folks on the scene. Can you tell us about some of the tools that are being used at the scene there? We noticed a drone up in the air. What is that being used for? So a drone is so that we can see overhead, we can see what's going on, and in particular, in a situation like this where it might be a large area, there might be areas of instability that our members can't get to, we want to see whether or not we can see any victims or anything that could be a danger to the first responders uh, across the scene. So we use these drones both to find additional victims and to protect our first responders in these dangerous conditions. And we understand you also have um, canine dogs at the scene. Can you tell us what they're doing? Yeah, so they are trained in search and rescue. Um, they are specifically trained to help us narrow down the search area and point to where there could be someone. So they're trained in that, and we're following their lead right now. Okay, FDNY Fire Commissioner Laura Kavanaugh, thank you for the insight. We uh, wish you the best going forward tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thanks, Take Commissioner. Care. All right, we're going to go now to CBS 2's uh, Tim McNicholas. He's been looking into the building and its history and any sort of uh, violations and complaints in the past. Tim, what have you found? Maurice and Christine, we have learned there have been some recent inspections at this property, and there are also some open violations. Seven open violations. That's according to the Department of Buildings Records. We're still looking through all those, but I want to read you a bit from one recent violation notice. This is from November of this year. An inspector wrote, quote, I observe there are deteriorated and broken mud sills with inadequate support for vertical members throughout. Goes on to say there is one vertical member with missing mud sill, which can compromise the structural stability, causing a potential collapse, injuring pedestrians or damaging property. Now, this is a large property. We don't know what part of the property that violation applies to or whether it was for the building itself or maybe a, a sidewalk shed nearby, something of that nature. These are questions we're looking into right now, and the Department of Buildings is also looking into them. We also don't know if those problems were ever fixed, but the violation is still listed as open with, quote, no compliance recorded. The records also show there has been some construction at the property recently. We know that because some of the open violations, including that one I just mentioned, is categorized as a construction violation. Christina Maurice, we're still looking at all this. We also know that there have been some complaints filed recently about the construction, so we'll have some more reporting on that uh, later this evening. But I think uh, you make right. an important point, Tim. We don't know if the violations were dealing directly with this corner of the building or another portion. That's still unclear at this point. Yeah, and we don't know what caused this collapse. So whether that violation contributed to this or not, right. it's all still being looked into. Very early in the investigation. But thank you so much, Tim. Appreciate it. And Tim, one quick other note before you go. If you can, if you and your producer have time, um, we've been wondering whether or not there's been construction, um, road construction specifically, in this area. So if there's a way that you guys can figure that out as well, that would help with our reporting. Because according to Professor Corbett, that could have also played a role in all of this. So trying to put all the pieces together here, if that's something that you can add to your list of things to do, we'd appreciate that, Tim. Thank we'll you. We'll definitely look into that. Early okay. On. Thanks right. so much. Let's go back to that live picture we were just starting to look at a second ago. That was a, a zoom in, a push in of a of a room, a home, someone's home right there at the corner of this building at the corner of 172 West Burnside Avenue uh, in Morris Heights there in the Bronx. We saw furniture upended, um, just stuff strewn all over the place. The side of the wall just ripped out almost like a set from a theater. Absolutely. Um, you're looking into the into a half uh, scene of a, of a home there. And right now, flashing lights everywhere. Just the last thing folks who live there would have expected at all. Professor Corbett is uh, back with us on the phone. And uh, look at this picture, Professor. It's really, it, it really tells a lot. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, so the tower ladder is up there. I guess, you know, you see the bucket of the tower ladder there on the left side with the light. Um, they're looking at, I guess, at the exterior wall there, um, adjacent to where the area collapsed. I think they're probably trying to figure out um, how much damage has been done to the, re the, the existing stuff that's still there behind it. It's possible doing that. Um, but, you know, as it gets dark tonight, um, you know, as the, the commissioner mentioned earlier, the number one focus is to make sure that no one is, in fact, still trapped in the building or under this pile. Um, and then it'll shift pretty quickly into stabilization mode and where they'll probably bring in some large equipment, cranes, things like that, um, as well as some, uh, you know, stabilization equipment to try to remove these hanging pieces of floors, basically, without bringing the rest of the building down with it. 
of course, the structural engineers will play a big role here, right? So the structural engineers uh, very often are actually going to be put up in a ladder truck like this to sort of understand exactly what's, you know, how badly it's damaged in the, the still remaining portion of the building and perhaps figure out how they're going to deal with it and stuff. So there's a lot that's going to happen overnight, um, you know, but again, the most important thing right now is to make sure that certainly uh, we find any trapped victims that are still in, in this in this situation and of course at the same time trying to make sure that we minimize the risk of uh, firefighters going in and around this pile and inside the building to make sure that they don't end up in a situation we call secondary collapse like what we're looking on the screen right now that tilted floor with all that all the belongings of those folks inside the building we want to make sure that uh, if that comes down, it doesn't, of course, fall on people down below who might be trying to rescue them. Absolutely. Their safety is paramount, as always, in these situations. Um, the heroes here of our city back at it once again um, in a time of danger and possibly even saving lives here as we continue to look at these live pictures in the Morris Heights section of the Bronx of a partial building collapse. You know, Professor, as you were talking about some of um, the structural damage and also then trying to make sure that this building doesn't collapse even further and bringing in that equipment, Whenever we cover stories like this, it's always the people that um, are always foremost in my mind. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way the residents of this building are going to be allowed back into their homes, given the situation here tonight. And we don't know how long it's going to take for um, you know, for the work to be done to make sure that this building is safe to eventually go back into. And I'm thinking of all these families that are now affected, particularly during the holiday season. Can you give us your best estimate of how long that type of work could take? Well, it's sort of going to be in phases. So the first, you know, again, once the rescue and recovery operations are over with, then it's going to be the stabilization and that could take several days to do that, um, potentially. Uh, it's hard to tell at this point, but it could take several days. And then once the building is stabilized, then they'll have to make an assessment of whether or not they'll allow people to go back in and get belongings. Certainly not, obviously, in this corner of the building, but the rest of the building to recover um, their, their goods and, and things like that. They'll do it on a, a scheduled basis, likely. But again, it's all... Pre it's all uh, based upon whether or not the structural engineers feel it's safe for people to go back in there. If this is if this is an indicator of a much larger problem, then they probably won't let them do that. And they'll take the whole building down, oh. basically. But but it's all it's all going to come down to again once they get remove this sort of unstable area of the building and and then sort of at the same time put um, put shoring up to sort of hold it in place. Then there may, you know, if the rest of the building is somewhat still intact, they may let people go back in again, small groups to get, you know, uh, their belongings and perhaps their pets and things like that uh, to get out to get them out. But um, this is going to, this building is going to be evacuated one way or another going forward. You know, whether or not it's ever reoccupied again on a full-time basis, that remains to be seen. But they're not going to let people back, you know, permanently into a situation like this. It's just going to be mainly just doing it uh, again in a way that, you know, kind of maximizes the amount of, of safety and minimizes the amount of risk when they do that. So, um, so it'll, 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 this will be several days of this. And of course, there's the traffic issues around it, um, you know, of dealing with that. The city's going to have to deal with that. Um, and then, of course, getting back to the folks you mentioned and everything. There's a lot of people that live in this building, and of course, the Red Cross is going to play a big role here in finding them temporary homes for the time being to get them through the next week or two until they can figure out what's going to happen going forward. Yes, yeah, so you, you, you know, you've seen this story over and over again on on CBS all the time of these large buildings that have to be vacated and finding room for all these people. Right, where do they go. Yeah, I was going to point out the Red Cross is en route to the scene as as we speak. So uh, we'll look out for them and when they arrive and how they're able to help people out. I just wanted to, to come back to that inspector uh, report from the Department of Buildings that, that they want to be clear as to what they wrote. One inspector wrote that I observe there are deteriorated and broken mud sills with inadequate support for vertical members throughout. 
Um, so if, for those right. who weren't here before, um, mud sills, you can describe what they are. Again, they're at the base of the building and they protect it. Right. Um, but what, right. What, is that, what does that sound like from what you're hearing? Well, basically, you know, everybody knows like a, a sill, a sill is, as I mentioned before, it's the base of the building. It's like a sill that you walk over in a doorway, right? That little bump. Well, basically, it's, 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 um, it's an element of the building. It's usually wood. Um, I'm assuming that's what this is here. Um, that they would have found on the inside of the building along the very edge of the building. So on the inside, in the basement, for example, um, they would do an inspection down here and walking around the perimeter of the basement, they may have noticed there's a lot of, and I'm just, again, this is pure speculation on my part, but there could have been a lot of water infiltration into that area over a very long period of time, and the wood is rotted, and it's still performing the, the role of supporting the walls above and the inspector apparently mentioned at least one place we don't know exactly where this is but at least one place was a vertical element that was missing there so a column of some type uh, or something along those lines so this is that that is that's a structural element in the building you know and so this isn't like there's a you know missing you know there's a missing uh window sill or something like that or, or some other more considered be minor Infraction. I mean, this is this could potentially be uh, the center of of why this happened today. And again, it may not be the only reason, but it may have been a situation where you have something like that it is deteriorated. That any other kind of uh, of you know of external um, you know uh, problem that's thrown at it, be it more water, all the rain that we had. Again, I mentioned the wind earlier, mm -hmm. perhaps the vibrations outside. All those are potential possibilities which may have caused the, the, the mud sill, which is already compromised, to be part of that collapse. So this will all be something that's looked on, looked at over the next, um, you know, several months, I'm sure. You know, they'll probably fairly quickly come to a conclusion about what happened here, but they'll need to write a report. And you'll remember when we were on, you know, a while back with the parking garage collapse, look at what happened after that. Now we're looking at parking garages across the city and several will be vacated because of structural problems. So, you know, we might be sitting on something here or looking at something here that may have uh, also be a precipitator, or, you know, cause for looking more closely at these types of older six, seven, five story occupied multiple dwellings. They're all thousands of them around and particularly in the Bronx and in the city and stuff to go back and look at them to figure out is there is there some kind of ongoing problem that this may be uh, more common in other kinds of buildings that we really don't know about so again this this might be the situation for that we will we'll, We'll have to find out. Yeah, this is the reality that we live in, um, living in New York City and the surrounding area as old as some of our buildings are, as we've mentioned here several times. Professor, I'm going to put you on hold for one more time. If you please don't hang up, because I'm sure we're going to be going back to you at some point. But we do want to get to Lisa Rosner. Uh, she has joined our other reporter, Jenna DeAngelis, on scene. Lisa, what information have you been able to gather? Well, Christine, we know there are dozens of first responders here on the way here coming up from Sedgwick Avenue. We couldn't even get through traffic because there was such an emergent, urgent situation. I want to step out just to give you a live look at this collapse here. I mean, it is just remarkable uh, how bare and exposed this building is. It looks like the floors are, uh, could collapse at any moment, what we see here. And uh, it, I don't know if our camera can see in the bottom floor, but but it looks like there was some kind of bodega on the bottom floor here. As we've been reporting, there's still a lot of information coming in. We don't know uh, if there are any injuries, but we do know there's an FDNY drone here looking out for that. And uh, we also want to bring you down the street um, close to the corner of uh, Burnside and Sedgwick Avenue, uh, where you can see just how many first responder vehicles are here. We have uh, fire trucks, ambulances, emergency response from the Department of Buildings, uh, even an MTA bus is here. So they are really prepared for anything that we might see coming out of this. And uh, let's go back to the live picture of the building for you right now. You can see even from the scaffolding from the street, you can see some of the metal uh, hanging down and right here at the floor level, a lot of rubble that poured out 
from this collapse. And um, you're looking at 172 West Burnside Avenue. We know there's dozens of apartments here, and uh, we don't know if the FDNY has evacuated everyone and how that's going to work. Obviously, a very tricky situation, how they can clear everyone out and do it safely. And uh, the N NYPD is asking the public to avoid the area, especially here between West Burnside Avenue and Osborne Place and Phelan Place here in the Bronx. And uh, we just spoke to a representative from the NYPD who says they will be having a press conference imminently. Uh, you can see here the FDNY uh, looking into the damage from above, looking to at, at any way they can to see if there is anyone trapped. Again, we do not know of any injuries at this time. You can see they're using uh, lights to shine down probably on every floor, get a feel for the situation here. And again, as I said, uh, the NYPD said they will be having a press conference shortly, and uh, we'll be sure to bring that to you live. For now, we are live in the Bronx. Lisa Rosner, CBS 2 News. Lisa, before you go, I just want to highlight one thing. If your photographer can just push back up into that scene with that bed, is tilting downwards because you guys have an excellent vantage point so different from what we had been watching earlier you've now moved around to the right of the building and you're looking inside as you go up a little bit there um, you can literally see how precarious the situation is from the other side we couldn't tell that this is almost going downhill at a 45 degree angle where stuff could just just fall out and at this point you can really get a feel for the damage the, um, the challenge that the firefighters are up against and, the and what danger. they're dealing with, the, da the, the danger imminent that danger, exists. right? Yeah. That it could still really just come sliding down at any moment. Obviously, the engineers are looking into that aspect of it, but now we get a good look. That looks like almost a 45 degree downhill angle where that debris can just come crashing down. So, a great look there, you guys. Nice work giving it, uh, bringing the pictures home to us. Uh, we really have a feel for it. Once again, um, as we come back out here, this, this, this happened this afternoon, suddenly right there at 172, um, just forgot the name of the road, that's West Burnside, Burnside. right? West yes. Burnside. And uh, it just sent the neighborhood into uh, just a, a frenzy here and, and firefighters on the scene trying to find people. There are no reports of any injuries at this point. They're looking to see if or who might be trapped at this point. It's unclear. Uh, if that's the case, a bodega on the ground floor, a seven-story building, dozens of apartments there. You're just hoping that people weren't around at this hour, but you know uh, sort of intuitively that, that there, there could very well have been people uh, in the building or at least on the ground floor or even the street uh, in, the, in the middle to late afternoon. And there you can see the drone on the right-hand side of your screen towards the top portion of the building. That drone continues to do its work being operated by an FDNY member down on the ground. That drone assessing um, areas that the FDNY cannot reach and getting a bird's eye view, so to speak, of the damage. But looking at these pictures, as you mentioned, Marie, uh, the camera angle that we have from Lisa's live shot really did um, emphasize the danger that still is present here at this corner um, in the Bronx because literally those the remaining portions that are still standing of those apartments are literally just in the air. I mean, at any point in time, they could collapse. And according to Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, they do continue to search for any possible victims. We do not know of any right now, but they do still have teams um, searching on the ground and through the building, through the area there. And also they have canine dogs um, as well searching that area as we continue to monitor this breaking development, a very dangerous uh, situation still unfolding on West Burnside Avenue. And as the commissioner said, they have specialized FDNY teams based right there in the Bronx. They train for this kind of thing, and today we're watching them springing into action. We're going to take a break here shortly. Uh, we'll come back with more headlines uh, from this scene and other headlines of the day. We'll be right back. CBS 2 News at 5.
Right now at 5.30, we continue following breaking news happening right now in the Bronx. A partial building has collapsed uh, right there, 172 West Burnside Avenue. We're looking at a picture of firefighters in the attempt to get to people who may be trapped in there. That That is unconfirmed exactly um, whether there are people trapped, but the way they're moving right now, you'll get the feeling that they're trying to rescue people. That would be what it appears to be to the untrained eye. But uh, that's the scene right there. We've been watching this building. It's, it came down uh, earlier this afternoon. There you see the corner of it just spontaneously collapsed and pancaked down in some cases. Uh, the search for people goes on at this hour. And they're using their bare hands, Maurice, to lift up some of that rubble right. to tell you just how del delicate of an operation this is unfolding this evening. Once again, good evening to you. I'm Christine Johnson. I'm Maurice Dubois. Thanks for joining us. We continue our team coverage. CBS 2's Alice Gaynor now. She's been speaking with witnesses. Maurice and Christine. This collapse. So Alice, tell us more about that. That's right, Maurice and Christine, when we got here, of course, there's this massive response going on. We ran into a gentleman across the street who's been working here for the past three months. He says for as long as he has worked here across the street, I'm going to step away so you can see what's going on behind me. For as long as he's worked here, he says that building has been under construction. He wasn't sure exactly what kind of work was being done there, but we spoke to him because he was here when it collapsed. He describes to us what he heard and what he saw. We heard something like some people screaming across the street so we go out to see what's going on we see this construction stuff will start cracking and then there was two guys doing some construction up there we see like a big rock start falling down <clears throat> then the whole building just fell down in like a second Again, you're looking at this massive response. We counted about four ladders up in the air. They've got a saw going over there. Again, no reports of any injuries, but they're checking right now. We've got FDNY Robotics right next to us. They've relaunched the drone up in the air. They are searching to make sure that no one was inside. That gentleman we were speaking to, Ahmed, he was so gracious to give us his time. He said he just it, couldn't believe it. I asked how long in between seeing those cracks and hearing the screams before the building collapsed. He said there was about two minutes in between. So it sounds like there was some kind of warning that something was going to happen. He says that the screams came from people who were just walking by on the street. He said he saw people coming out of the bodega, that convenience store that was underneath there. I said, do you think everyone was able to make it out? He said he thought so, he sure hoped so. But again, we are still awaiting more information from the FDNY. They are supposed to hold a news conference in a short time. Again, you could see them just working away here. We keep seeing that saw going. They got all kinds of roads blocked off here in the area. And once we get some more information, Christina Maurice, we will bring you the very latest. Hey, Alice, I didn't catch it the first time you said it, but two minutes between screams and actual collapse. What, what was it that they were seeing yes. or hearing at that point that led them to scream? Could you tell? Sure. So I asked him, I said, well, why were they screaming? He said that the construction workers had put some kind of hole into the building. He thought they were drilling, perhaps, is what happened. I said, well, could you see into any of the apartments this, this hole? He said he couldn't really describe it, but that's what first happened. Uh, that's according to this gentleman. He said there were all kinds of cracks forming on the building. So there was some kind of warning, it sounds like, people had. So they were able to run and get away. And he thought he, again, he's estimating, he thought perhaps there was two minutes in between the screams, the cracks, the hole, and then the building actually collapsing. We're trying to obtain some security video in the area. We do see a bunch of cameras. Their cameras, unfortunately, were not working across the street, so they did not capture it. And this gentleman only had video in the aftermath because, of course, he was just shocked watching this all unfold. And again, fully understanding that he saw this, you know, it's all heat of the moment and crazy like that. But to say that there was a hole in the building, did that look like a mistake or an accident? Could he tell? He couldn't. I kept pressing him to find out what kind of hole this was. He said it seems like the construction workers were drilling, but again, this gentleman isn't sure what kind of work was being done at this building. He only noted he's worked here for three months, and for that amount of time, as long as he's worked here, there's been construction going on. So we're awaiting more information on the specifics of that. Okay. Good insight, though, Alice. Thank, thank you, thank you Alice. so much. Appreciate that. In the meantime, let's go back to CBS 2's Jenna DeAngelis. She is also at the scene, continuing our team coverage on this breaking news 
this evening, this partial building collapse in Morris Heights. Jenna, what can you tell us now? Well, Maurice and Christine, I can tell you there are a lot of people standing by. There's a sense of shock and disbelief from neighbors that are staring at this building and just seeing people's homes exposed. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, but you can just see people's belongings, a bed, um, appliances, people's clothing. Um, exposed at this building at this collapse and it looks to be six stories of apartments and then the main floor is a bodega. We actually spoke with a woman earlier who said she stopped by here earlier was at the bodega. Everything was fine. She frequents this building often and then was home saw the news and came out here and just couldn't believe what she saw. Take a listen. I was laying down in my bedroom and I looked on TV and I said oh this is around the corner and I ran out and said let me see if you know it was around the corner. What's your name? My name is Tia. <laughs> the snitch on my this is weird. Like to me, I'm scared. I don't even want to be in my own place. I'm scared. You can see the living room. We can see the bedroom. We can see in the whole building right now. It's sad. It's really sad. Uh, it certainly is sad to step back and take a look at all of this. Now, again, this is 172 West Burnside Avenue, and the FDNY responded to this at about 3.30 this afternoon, so they've been out here for two hours. Our other reporters pointed this out. This is a massive scene. The FDNY tells us they have specialized teams here. So far, no word on injuries, no reported injuries, but again, they have specialized teams going through the rubble. We saw canines. We saw the drone up. Uh, there is a massive amount of firefighters on the ground, and then, of course, up on the ladders. Um, trying to get a scope of exactly what happened here. We're going to continue talking to people out here and we'll bring you another live update for, for now back to you in the studio. Okay, All right, Jenna, Jenna, thank you so much. Let's go back to CBS2 investigative reporter Tim McNicholas. He's been looking into the records and the uh, history of the building. Tim, what have you found? Maurice and Christine, we dug into the records. We found there were multiple permits just issued today at that intersection related to sidewalk construction work. Some of those permits were for replacing the sidewalk and for the use of equipment, including a backhoe. So you can see there was some work happening there. But even though the permits were issued today, they aren't valid until the 30th. So what we don't know is whether that work to replace the sidewalk had already started, and if so, to what extent. We're also still looking into whether that contributed in any way to the collapse. And those same questions apply to the seven open violations we found at the property in the Department of Buildings records. In one of those open violations from November of this, from November of this year, an inspector wrote, I observe there are deteriorated and broken mud sills with inadequate support for vertical members throughout. Goes on to say there is one vertical member missing, with missing mud sill, I should say, which can compromise the structural stability, causing a potential collapse, injuring pedestrians or damaging property. Now, this is a large property. We don't know what part of the property that violation applies to, or whether it was for the building itself or perhaps a, a sidewalk shed. Those are all questions we're looking into, and the Department of Buildings is looking into them as well. That violation that I just mentioned is still listed as open with, quote, no compliance recorded. Some of the open violations, including that one I just mentioned, categorized as a construction violation. Christina Maurice. Tim, thank you for that update. We'll continue to let you do your work, figure out exactly what was going on and what are some of the contributors, what are some of the contributing factors that could have played a role in this partial building collapse here this afternoon. Thanks, Tim. Let's go back to the phone now. Uh, Professor Glenn Corbett, F, Professor of Fire Sciences at John Jay. Professor, we've now got a, had a look a couple of times at uh, Massive group of firefighters on the ground going through the rubble. We saw what looked like a saw, chainsaw of some type. We saw them grabbing debris with their hands. We still see um, firefighters in the bucket there off the ladder looking at the building itself. What do you make of what you saw uh, from those pictures? Sure. So the, the firefighters uh, now are obviously uh, underneath that collapse zone, which is, which is dangerous. Um, but they're searching that pile, I would imagine, because they want to make sure that, in fact, there are no victims down here. On the right side of your screen, I see a, a, a traffic camera over there. So there may be, you know, we heard earlier that some of the um, storefront uh, cameras were not working. Um, and, you know, they may be using city cameras. They may, they may believe that someone may be walking by, although... We heard earlier also that there was some kind of warning before this happened, maybe a minute or two. So right now they're going to basically go layer by layer uh, to see if they can uh, access an area where they believe someone may be located. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know if these are live images right now, but we saw earlier where they were removing debris off the top of the pile. So that's the way they're going to do it because you don't want to bring in heavy equipment right now because if there are survivors in there or what have you, you don't want to basically obviously do more damage than good by by doing it that way. You know, so one thing I wanted to ask, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but, but, but earlier sure. we had a witness who says he saw people uh, screaming and in distress because it appeared to them that um, to him that others had said there was a, 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 equipment, a piece of equipment struck a hole in the building and then there were two minutes but when, and during which time people ran away and right. then the building, the facade came down. Does, right. does that sound like a scenario that, that makes sense to you? Yeah, it certainly could. And like I said, you know, the mud sills were an issue we talked about, you know, they're being deteriorated. I mean, a lot of times when you have something like this happen, it's not just one thing that happens. It's a series of things. And it may have been some work that was being done on the building. And they basically compromised that exterior wall, which, of course, is, is all brick. You can see there's a floor on the video right now. You can see all the wood beams. Well, those wood beams fit into pockets, holes in that brick wall, and that's what holds them up. So that's why when the... As I mentioned earlier, when, when the wall went down, he effectively pulled the, these floors with them because there's no other support for them for the most part on that end. So, but yeah, it's very possible that's, that that um, scenario in which they were doing something, they probably did so, enough damage that things started to fall and that's maybe why people were yelling. Um, maybe that was helpful in the sense that if there were in fact people in these rooms, that they felt the vibration and things starting to move and maybe it gave them time to get out. But we, again, we, this is all speculation. Of course, we don't know exactly what happened here, but, but again, the, the, you know, they're going to try to find all the evidence when this is over with the evidence of what happened. And I think that traffic camera that's in front there, hopefully it might have a view of the front of that corner there that might tell us something about, you know, what was a series of events that led up to this? Was it, was it some construction work? Was it some, some, something going on in the front of the building that sort of set this thing in motion where a couple minutes later it went down very quickly? Can you talk a little bit more, and I'm going to ask our control room, if we have that picture that we had up earlier, the live shot of the firefighters there um, digging through the rubble. Maurice mentioned that they had a chainsaw. We saw them uh, digging through just the debris with their bare hands. Um, you can see a whole team of them there on the ground, Professor. Talk about this process a little bit and how delicate of a process this is and also the danger that these firefighters are themselves in. Well, to start with that point, they are, they're in great danger because as you can see, that corner of the building has still got, still has uh, floors basically suspended only on one end. So one of them actually went down completely, but they're only suspended on one end. So that's still a danger point. You know, in rescue, in rescue verbiage, a lot of times we call things like that widow makers because they're hanging above your head while you're trying to do these things. And, you know, you don't want to be in a position where if it does start to fall above um, that, you're going to get hit by it. And, of course, that's why the, the tower ladders there are looking at all that to make sure there's no movement at all. So it's a precarious operation. They Apparently, if this is a live view, they removed a lot of the debris in that one corner there where perhaps they believe someone might be located. And then they're going to have to figure out, um, you know, how they're going to access the areas underneath uh, what appears to be the remains of that scaffold and maybe one of the floors there uh, to get underneath it to see if there's any possible uh, ability for someone to survive, you know, survive in that what we call a void space, basically an area that's that's it's small, but it's survivable, and that's probably what they're going to be looking for. So they're, I'm sure that they've got all these things going on simultaneously. Engineers again are there looking at the building. They're trying to give guidance to the firefighters. Say, look, yes, you can go. No, I don't think you should go, based upon what they're seeing. So it's a, it is a complex operation. Okay, so just to, you had a lot of information in there. So just to, to reiterate and so that we can be clear for our viewers, you believe that there may be an area that they've already cleared out where there possibly could be um, people trapped. 
the ladder um, and the, the FDNY member that's on the ladder is sort of looking as a lookout to make sure that the structure is stable enough and to give any warning sign then to the firefighters that are below who are now trying to clear the rubble. Do I have that correct? Yeah, and, and again, the drone is doing the same thing as well. I mean, they're kind of trying to figure out what, um, you know, like I said, what's the chance of more of that building that corner of the building coming down and can they do any kind of search operations there safely uh, the thing it tells me is that the fact that they were working there leads me to believe they think there might be somebody down there if they were uh, pretty much 100 percent sure that they had video for example of the building as the collapse went as it happened and they saw obviously there was nobody there they also watched the collapse happen they didn't see any people in that i think they would they would probably have not done that but you notice now that I think they've pulled back again. So I'm not sure, like, again, it's, it's a sort of going through a decision process here of do we believe there's still people down there, again, someone walking by, um, or did someone actually fall out of one of the, the floors here and end up in this pile? Mm. Um, you know, and so they're going to have to, you know, I'm sure they went to the building owner or the superintendent to try to get a rundown of who's in each apartment, and they're probably working on that right now to sort of figure out what um what's going on that by the way that tower ladder that's there now up against the wall i i suspect i may be wrong about this but i suspect he's actually watching the rest of the building so he's not so much concerned about that he's probably taking photographs and stuff because they're going to be looking to see those same wooden beams that you see uh to the right of that bucket that tower ladder bucket to the very far end you can see the wood you can see some of them still have bricks attached to it mm -hmm. so they may be actually looking at the rest of the building to see if there's any separation of the of those of those uh, wooden beams or the wall away from the floor like toward away where that air conditioner is toward that direction so they may be doing that wow. so um but they'll be like i said they're they're trying to figure out is there anyone who perhaps within the building, you know, the after school or children in the building, adults, whatever, and trying to narrow the list down to figure out what's the chance of somebody being, again, in that corner pile there underneath. So um, that's what they're probably doing. And they did, the, I guess, some surface work, which was the easiest stuff to do. What comes next is the more difficult stuff, particularly if they're going to have to actually uh, effectively tunnel underneath some of this pile. Um, then that requires more expertise and more equipment and stuff to do that as they try to literally send equipment and perhaps firefighters in there to search. And when they've got search cams, they've got the dogs they mentioned earlier. So these are all ways to try to, again, narrow down, is in fact somebody in there? And can we see them? Can we hear them? That kind of thing. So. Well, Professor Glenn Corbett, we cannot thank you enough for your expertise, really bringing us up close and personal with uh, this hero work that's going on right now, FDNY special unit there on the scene of the building collapse, trying to find any people who may be trapped there. Uh, we will stay on this. We thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to take thank a break you. here. Uh, our continuing coverage of the breaking news, the partial building collapse in the Bronx. We'll be right back.
We continue our team coverage now of the building collapse in the Bronx with CBS 2's Alice Gaynor. She's been talking with witnesses who saw the collapse and even the moments beforehand. Alice, what do you have? I'm so sorry, but you got to be on the yellow. Hey, I'm so sorry. Uh, first responders want us to move, so we'll try and do this as we move. We want to show you just how large the response is here. You can see all of the NYPD officers here, all of the FDNY. A lot of folks are moving over because a press conference is supposed to get underway sometime in the next 30 minutes. There are multiple fire trucks here with the ladders up. They have been doing work over by the building. As you mentioned, I did speak with a worker across the street who saw the collapse happen. What he describes is that he heard screams, people who were just walking by on the street. He describes either seeing or hearing cracks. So it appears there was some kind of a warning to the people outside and also in the bodega, which is located under this building where this collapse happened. My colleague, Naveen Dhaliwal, actually spoke spoke with the bodega owner where this collapse happened, and he described hearing the cracks, which is what gave him the warning to get out of that bodega. We are about to hear more information from officials in a press conference. First responders want us to move our camera right now, but I want you to listen to some of the interview uh, with the man who I spoke with who works across the street. He says he's worked here for about three months, and during those three months, he describes construction work going on across the street. He's not sure exactly what that work has been, uh, what that work is exactly, but he says there has definitely, there's been construction workers here. He says he saw them today. Uh, so let's take a listen to what he described. We heard something like some people screaming across the street, so we go out to see what's going on. We see this construction stuff, we start cracking, and then there was two guys doing some construction up there. We see like a big rock start falling down. <clears throat> Then the whole building just fell down in like a second. So back out here, back out here live to me, they've just moved us back because I think they're going to try and move um, one of these trucks out of the way. We are getting ready for this press conference. We understand the mayor, Mayor Eric Adams, is supposed to be here as well. A lot of people want answers. You know, what sort of work was going on here at the time? How did this happen? Hopefully. Everyone's okay so far. They're saying no injuries reported, but we've been seeing them uh, searching that drone. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but there's a drone the FDNY has that's been up in the air. They use that in these situations to search to see if they can, you know, find anyone. They also have microphones to see if they can pick up some of the noise down there. So hopefully in a few minutes, we should at least get some preliminary answers as to what happened here today. Maurice and Christine insight there from the bodega owner from across the street, Alice. Apparently, um, he said it had a couple minutes between the time they first heard the cracks and started running um, and then the time that the building collapsed. A couple minutes was his perception. Oftentimes, people's perceptions of two minutes may be off by a bit. We can, you know, at least allow for that. But they had time, apparently, to get away. Um, wondering if you've had a chance to look at or get any insight into what's going on with the the firefighters going through the rubble that we're looking at in the live picture on, on the screen here. So it's hard for us to see. There's fencing up at the ground level, kind of blocking our view. But every so often, we see sparks flying from the machinery they're using to cut various pieces of metal to move some of that rubble that fell as a result of this collapse. But other than that, we can't see a whole lot of movement right now. But we know that they're over there. And again, they have multiple ladders concentrated on the building. Hopefully, in a few minutes, we'll definitely know some more information. We do see, you know, there's ambulances here. But of course, uh, those are empty gurneys. We don't see anybody on them. And again, as of right now, they're saying no injuries. They haven't found anybody, but we know they are definitely working. It's a delicate operation, as Christine has talked about. They've got the drone up in the air. If my photographer, Matt, can pan up, you could see that drone that's been steadily up there. Uh, working to see if there's any signs of movement, anything in the building. But right now, it appears, hopefully, that people had some sort of warning. And we know that at least people on the ground level were able to run away. They knew this building was about to come down. Alice, you know, when we talk to these eyewitnesses, I'm sure that this is flashing through their mind and in their memory, and you almost see it in slow motion um, as you recall what you just witnessed. Did you get a sense that uh, the person that you spoke with there was still in a state of shock as to what he saw here this afternoon? 
He seemed to be okay. I asked him, you know, what's going through your mind? He says, this happens all over the place in other countries as well. He was pointing out sort of matter of factly. So he didn't seem to be terribly affected by it. Certainly it was shocking. He took multiple videos. And again, as Maurice pointed out, perception of time during an emergency, during a situation like this, you know, something could, could feel like it, it takes much longer than it actually does. I mean, he said the collapse took seconds, but he said the time in between the cracks and the screams and the actual collapse to him felt like two minutes. Certainly that could be completely off. We're waiting to see if we can get some security camera footage uh, from around the areas. There's a few apartment buildings across the street. They have cameras out here, but we haven't been able to obtain any of that footage just yet. But you can bet if it exists, the FDNY, the NYPD, they will certainly gather that for their investigation here. Yes, a big important piece of the puzzle, Alice. Thank you for that. We do appreciate it. As we continue our breaking news coverage, we are going to take a quick break as we await a news conference with the mayor and also the FDNY commissioner. Stay with us for, for continuing coverage. We'll be right back. This is CBS 2 News at 6. Right now at 6, breaking news. A partial building collapse in the Bronx, leaving the corner of a seven-story building exposed. It's prompted a massive emergency response from the FDNY, NYPD, and more. And now the search for answers, how this happened, and whether anyone was injured. Good evening, I'm Dick Brennan. Dana is off tonight. We have live team coverage of this breaking news story. Our crews in Morris Heights are speaking to people in the neighborhood as first responders search for any possible victims. CBS 2's investigative reporter Tim McNicholas is digging into past issues of the building. We begin at the scene with CBS 2's Alice Gaynor. Alice, what can you tell us? 
Dick, just a massive response that's been going on for the past couple of hours. They're actually moving us back right now. I want to show you behind me. This is a live look at what's going on at the scene right now. Uh, the building is actually around the corner from our view. Again, first responders have moved us back from where we were standing before. We are awaiting a press conference at any moment with the FDNY, the mayor, other officials are here. As you mentioned, I did speak with a gentleman. As soon as we got here, I noticed someone across the street street in their business, he told me that he saw this lapse happen. And the way he described it was he heard screaming from people who were simply walking by on the street. And he noticed people running out. He said he heard or saw cracks in the building. And that's what gave people the warning to get out of the way that something was going to happen. That is backed up by the fact that Naveen Dhaliwal, my colleague, spoke to the bodega owner who works in the building directly below this collapse, where this collapse happened. He too describes hearing the cracks and running out of the bodega. So it appears there was some kind of warning here so people were able to run to safety. At this time though, the FDNY is still searching the building to see if anyone might be trapped under that rubble. The FDNY robotics team has the drone up in the air. We know they have microphones to listen for any sounds, uh, any indication that there might be people they can rescue. So far, though, we're told no injuries. But once again, the FDNY, NYPD, the mayor, they are expected to hold a press conference, a news conference, and give us the very latest information. Because right now, we just don't have a whole lot of information. As the hours go on, we are sure to get some more. But right now, we're just talking to witnesses out here who are describing that collapse, which took just seconds, merely seconds, for that building to pancake down like that. Dick? Alice, I have to ask you, because you talk about one crucial piece of information, and that is whatever alerted people, that two minute gap that gave people time apparently to run or scream or get out, uh, was it a sound of a crack? Did he make it clear whether people could feel the building shift? What did this witness say? The witness I spoke to who works across the street, he says he has worked here for about three months. And during those three months, he says there has consistently been some kind of construction work going on at that building. He could not describe for me what the work was. He said something interesting earlier. Now, again, this is his perspective. I cannot confirm what he was saying. He said there was some kind of a hole. He believes the construction workers were drilling. That is what this witness across the street described to me. He said there was drilling. He said there were cracks and either people saw those cracks or they heard them. The, the okay, gentleman Alice. who Naveen Dhaliwal spoke to who owns, go ahead, is the presser about to begin? Uh, we are waiting for the press conference, I believe. Is it beginning to start now? Okay, let's go to the press conference the mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, we're, we're here in the, in the Bronx, and I'm joined by uh, my local elections in the area, Bronx, uh, uh, President uh, Gibson, uh, uh, District Attorney Clark, Assemblywoman Tapia, Councilwoman Sanchez, and also my agency heads are here as well. Uh, nice and Commissioner Isco will give us an overview of what happened and where the residents are. Uh, FDNY Commissioner Kavanaugh will give you the actions we're taking place right now on the scene and what the procedures are. And DOB Commissioner Otto will give the history of the building and if any uh, open violation. Uh, this incident took place approximately at uh, 3.30 p.m. There was a partial collapse of a residential building here in Morris High section of the Bronx. Our first responders responded immediately and because of uh, video observation, we were able to have a preliminary review and communication with the owner of the store, of uh, our preliminary information with the owner of the store, that everyone that was in the store is out at the time. And FDNY, we give you an overview of exactly where we are, if there are any other people we believe are caught in the rubbish uh, at all. So I want to turn it over now to our nice commissioner, Commissioner Isco. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for being out here tonight. Uh, the building, we had a partial building collapse here at approximately 3.30 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Fire department units were on scene. Within a minute, 36 was their response time. And almost immediately, we started the inter process. So we brought out all of the utility companies to shut off power and gas to the building. We have Red Cross that is out here helping us to assist with individuals 
NYPD is on the scene, keeping everybody safe, cordoning off the area. Buildings, HPD is doing their preliminary investigations into the partial building collapse. Uh, for residents of the building, we're directing them to a service center that we have set up at Public School 390, uh, just up the block. Uh, we will have a service center there. We also have the MTA out here with four warning, warming buses for residents who need it. Um, so there's a real collective effort that's taking place out here to serve the needs of the uh, people who live in this building and this community uh, as we go through this process. But again, any residents that need a place to stay tonight, please go to PS390. Uh, we will have teams there to help find you a place to stay uh, for the duration of this event. And now I'll turn it over to Commissioner Kavanaugh, who will discuss uh, some of the search and rescue operations and life safety part of this operation. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's really important to enforce that this is an ongoing operation. So our members behind me as we speak are still conducting search and rescue, and they will do so until we either find someone or confirm that there is no one under that rubble. So as Zach mentioned, our units were here were in under two minutes, and all of our specialized training and resources that we have for an incident like this have gone to work. We have our drone up surveying the area, seeing if we can find additional information about potential patients and areas of potential instability. We have our canine unit here helping us search for potential victims. And we have all of our special, specially trained firefighters, tactical units, collapse units, and our EMTs and rescue medics who are trained specifically to treat someone in a collapse. So this is an ongoing operation. I'd like to ask Chief Hodgins to add just a little bit to that, um, but this is going to be ongoing for a few hours until we find someone or confirm that there is no one here. Good evening. As the Commissioner stated, we arrived in one minute and 36 seconds. We immediately vacated, uh, evacuated the building, got all the residents out, and started to concentrate <laughs> on the uh, debris pile in front of the building. Uh, working that and trying to search for any victims. We had dogs do searches, and at this time, we are, you know, that is our main objective, is to get to the bottom of that pile. We'll be here until it's we're down to the street level, just to make sure if there are any victims under there, hopefully we can get to them in time. But it's an ongoing operation. It's this type of operation we train for every day at our training facility. Um, our specialized units, we have a pile of debris at the rock and we, we train uh, exactly under these conditions for this day that hopefully doesn't happen too often. This is a uh, 1927 building in seven stories. Any building that's higher than six stories falls within the jurisdiction of our facade law in New York City. Uh, these folks, the owner of this building, uh, submitted their most recent uh, report in March of 21. That report did find unsafe facade conditions, seven of them, uh, mortar that was deteriorating, cracked bricks. There is an active permit, a permit that's valid until uh, next summer. Work was being done on this building as recently uh, as a few days ago. I know you'll be interested in the history of the building in terms of violations. There are seven, uh, right now we see seven uh, open violations, five ECB, two DOB, but they are not structural violations. It has to do with the uh, sidewalk shed, the fact that it didn't have proper lighting, uh, et cetera. There are drawings that were submitted as part of the process to pull the permit that speaks to the part of the right lower corner that is collapsed. So obviously, we are, uh, will take a strong look at that. Uh, our engineers and our inspectors hope to be able, once given the green light from FDNY, to get in the, the building and the second part of the H building to do an inspection, and we'll have more answers uh, after that. Can we feel a few questions? So if folks have questions, just let us know. We'll get to as many as we can. Go ahead. Uh, Mayor, so we spoke with several residents today who are on the street, and they actually saw someone drilling into the facade of the side of this building, and then cracking, and then a few seconds 
seconds later, the building starts to give way. I don't know if you or the commissioner can speak to what that drilling might have been, and what more can you tell us about that quadrant of the building that you were specifically looking at drawing? Can't, can't tell you much more. I certainly can't speak to what the drilling is, don't know what it what it's about. Again, we're taking a look at the, uh, the, the drawings that they submitted as part of the permit. And I want to be clear, unsafe facade conditions is not the same as an unsafe building. But uh, we are taking a good look at, at the paperwork, the drawings that they submitted, and we'll have some answers. As soon as we have answers, obviously, we'll share with you. Was anybody working on the building today? They, we don't believe that there were folks working on the facade work today. So far, as of now, we think the most recent work on the facade was several days ago. We got other questions. Hey, folks, folks, I need you to raise your hand if you have questions so we know who's speaking with the charge here. Go ahead. Can you give us a little more information on the search and rescue efforts? Yes. Uh, in the front of the building where the building the collapses, there's a large debris pile. And we don't know if anybody's trapped under there. Hopefully not. But what we're doing is we're tunneling in to that debris pile as safely as we can. Uh, firefighters right now are in a dangerous position. We don't know what caused this uh, corner of the building to come down, and we don't know if any more of it's going to come down. But we're searching for life, and that's our main objective at this time. Okay, someone who works at the bodega said that people were working on the sidewalk shed. Do you know that? Have you confirmed that? And have those people been accounted for? I, I, don't, I don't have any information on that work, so I can't really comment on it. Timetable. We will search the whole debris pile until every piece is picked up, and we can see that they, whether there's anybody there or not. Good. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. of this partial building collapse. We did learn a few new things. First of all, this is still very much a search and rescue operation. You just heard the chief saying there that firefighters are on that debris pile, which is just outside of the area of the collapse, and they are tunneling in, as he put it, as safely as they can. But of course, we all know just how dangerous this work is. But as the chief said, they are searching for life. As for the building itself, it was built in 1927. It's seven stories. In March of 21, there were reports of an unsafe facade conditions, but you heard the chief saying there that that doesn't necessarily mean the building was unsafe. There were cracked bricks and work was being done as of a few days ago, although no report on what witnesses told our Alice Gaynor that there was drilling going on in the building shortly before the collapse. So as of now, the search goes on for signs of life, but no reports of any injuries as of yet. Let's go live to the scene to CBS 2's Jenna DeAngelis now. Jenna, what can you see from where you're at? Well, Dick, I can tell you from speaking with people here, there's definitely a sense of shock and disbelief being here and looking at this. I spoke to a woman earlier who said she came to this bodega earlier today. Everything was fine, turned on the news, saw what was happening, ran out here and couldn't believe it. I want to give you a look at the building uh, we've been showing you. You can just see right inside people's apartments. And the FDNY stressed that their main goal right now is searching for potential victims. They mentioned it's dangerous for firefighters because the stability of the building is unclear, but their main objective is to get through that debris pile tonight and again search for possible victims. They said they'll be here until that debris pile is down to the ground and they have special training for this. As you mentioned, Dick, this is a 1927 building with seven stories and work was being done as recently as a few days ago here. The uh, DOB said once uh, the FDNY gives them the go ahead, they'll go in with engineers and inspectors and do an inspection so uh, they can get in and hopefully have more answers as to what's happened here. But again, Again, uh, be, just standing here and uh, being here for several hours now, taking this all in, it really is uh, quite a shocking and devastating scene. Um, officials here also spoke about uh, assistance for the people who lived here. Um, they brought out the utility companies to make sure they turn off the power and gas. They evacuated the rest of the building. The Red Cross is here assisting. 
They set up an area at a local school where people can go who lived here who need somewhere to stay. Uh, they also have warming buses in the area for those people. But again, this is an ongoing operation as the FDNY stressed. They're using their drones. They have canines. Uh, they're bringing out really all the stops to get to the bottom of what happened here. And of course, if there are any victims underneath the rubble. That's it for now. Here, I'll send it back to you, Dick. But Jenna, I have to ask you, you look at that building, you've seen all these neighborhoods in the Bronx and all across the city. That building built in 1927 looks like any other building we might see in the city of New York. And I would imagine that has to make the people in the area frightened. What are the people who live in the buildings in the surrounding area telling you right now? They must be frightened. Well, that woman I spoke with earlier that said she came to the bodega here earlier, one of the things she said was, this makes me worried about being in my apartment, in my building. I think uh, everyone who lives in a, in a building can look at this and think that, oh my gosh, this could happen to me in my building. And it raises those safety questions about uh, what maybe was going on with this building. So I think that's something that a lot of people are going to want to know the answers to. What was going on here and how could something like this happen? Because again, when you step back and look at this, um, it's just shocking. Absolutely extraordinary scene and one of real terror. You can only imagine what it was like for the people who were there when it happened. Jenna DeAngelis, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go to Naveen Dhaliwal now, and she's been there for a few hours. And Naveen, uh, I understand you've been speaking to people in these surrounding areas. What are you hearing from? Yeah, Dick, uh, many people on the streets right now there, as Jenna had mentioned, they're in shock. They're trying to figure out, you know, what about their own buildings? Now, I'm just about a block away from where Jenna is uh, looking onto uh, West Burnside Avenue here. And right now they are taking off uh, parts of the building and they're, you can see the debris in the middle of the roadway. They've been collecting it here and people have been watching this. Again, uh, about a one block radius from the building side is blocked off right now. Uh, as we heard, all residents inside the building got out safe but we heard the the fire commissioner say earlier this is still a live search it's a live scene they're still searching for people possibly um, in the debris underneath uh, right now the canine units are here as well uh, we heard um, officials say that residents were taken to a service center at PS 390 that's over on Andrews Avenue about two blocks from where we are and if anyone is looking for um, any shelter that that is where they should go now I did speak to a bodega owner that is, the bodega was actually at the bottom of this building that had the collapse. And that bodega owner was inside the bodega. He was working, and he says he felt the building shake. He heard the cracks, and he ran out. Within seconds, he said, he looked back, and he watched the building crumble. That partial collapse happened. He says he just for a second, he couldn't even think that this actually happened. But we did have a chance to speak to him. Take a listen. Lo que escuchamos fue un crack, como cuando algo se está cayendo y logramos salir todos. Y cuando llegamos a salir, ahí mismo se desplomó todo. Now, he's had the bodega for about a year and a half. He says he does not know if the bodega is in any condition to be back. He has no idea what's going on. As you can imagine, this is very early into this investigation because we don't even know what caused this. But again, he is OK. Uh, other employees, and uh, I believe it was one customer in there, he said that he, that person is also OK. And right now, the residents inside uh, are at a service location. And we are watching here, we're watching here as they are taking parts of this building. They're trying to take the debris, they're bringing it back over here, and the search continues. Dick, back to you. Extraordinary. Only one person inside. They both got some sort of warning to get out in time. And also, fortunate, we think, we hope, that nobody was walking around the building at the time because we understand there are schools in the area. Naveen Dhaliwal, thank you very much. So many questions we have about this building. Our investigative reporter, Tim McNicholas, has been studying this for the past few hours. Uh, Tim, what have you found? Well, Dick, I, I know we reported that this building is more than 90 years old at this point, but I think we actually just got a photo of this building that was taken between 1939 and 1941. If we could show that, that would be great. I looked at the photo earlier, and it appears to be pretty similar to the way the building looks right now. There, not much has changed. There it is right there. So you can see 
That's pretty much what the building looks like today. And here's what we know so far. There were multiple permits just issued today related to sidewalk construction at that intersection. Some of those permits were for replacing the sidewalk and for the use of equipment, including a backhoe. So you can see there was some work happening there. But even though the permits were issued today, they aren't valid until the 30th. So what we don't know is whether that work to replace the sidewalk had already started, and if so, to what extent. We're also still looking into whether that contributed in any way to the collapse. The same questions apply to the seven open violations that were found at the property in Department of Buildings records. And in one of those violations from November of this year, an inspector wrote about a, a missing mud seal, saying it could, quote, compromise the structural stability, causing a potential collapse, injuring pedestrians, damaging property. Now, the Department of Buildings commissioner just spoke, and he indicated that the violations, the open violations, are not structural in nature. What it might be is, is related to a sidewalk shed at the property. So we're still looking into that, and we're also still looking into other violations of the property. That one violation that I just mentioned, by the way, the mud sill, still listed as open with no compliance recorded. Uh, there are also some other issues in August, and there's still uh, complaints that have been filed over the past few months related to the construction, sifting through all that right now, Dick. And I have to say that some of the things we were listening to the Buildings Commissioner, they sounded almost counterintuitive. He said at one point uh, there were reports of an unsafe facade, but that doesn't mean the building was structurally unsound. And yet he also said that they were cracked, cracked bricks, too, uh, and that the seven violations were not structural. Did you find that all adding up in your head? Well, it seems like something we need to investigate. I'll tell you that right now. Those complaints of the unsafe facade, I believe they date back to about 2020. That's what I found in my notes and what I was looking into earlier. So have those records. We're still looking into them, and we've got a lot of questions to ask. Well, Tim Nick Nicholas, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, as you can tell, the story is still breaking. We're working to learn how this happened, what comes next for the people affected, and the search goes on for any survivors. Stay with us for continuing coverage streaming on CBS News New York and on the air on our late news at 11 p.m., and we will be right back.
We continue to follow breaking news. This is the scene on Billingsley Terrace in Morris Heights of a partial building collapse. So far, at least, no reports of injuries, but firefighters are said to be still searching the pile for anyone who might be trapped. At this point, there are no reports of injuries. Um, we've just gotten some video that we want to show you. It's of the collapse itself. Take a look. Whoa. Wow. There it goes in the background, and you can see in the foreground, people were just walking. You can see one person running from their car right beneath the collapse. And here, I guess you're seeing the, the mad scramble. This is another angle, a little closer, actually. And the cloud of dust that went bursting out, and this gentleman's so lucky to be getting out alive with that thing falling down basically right on top of him. You can see in the background, too, there were people walking on the street where that building collapsed. So uh, let's hope, let's hope they did get out safely. And we will continue to cover this all evening long and stay with this as we get more information. Um, Lonnie, there has been some talk about the heavy rain last night because that was really intense and nobody knows what the cause of this collapse was, but there's always a thought that perhaps that something unstable can become mm -hmm. even more unstable. Look, New York City picked up about an inch and a half, a little bit over an inch and a half of rain. Now, portions of our area, I mean, saw five inches of rain, but in the city itself, in, in the area where the collapse took place, let's say between an inch and a half and two inches of rain. Uh, I, I'm not a structural engineer, so I can't tell you what that would do to a building. Uh, I'm going to stay away from that, but that's what you had. Uh, and, and the winds also were not to the level to where they could do damage like that. Let me show you what we've got. Because yesterday, hey, you had bigger winds yesterday. You had rainfall. That storm is a memory. 41 degrees as of right now. The winds that we're looking at, all right, they're going to continue to get weaker as you push through the late night hours tonight. Cooler temperatures for your day tomorrow all the way through Thursday an overall tranquil week that lies ahead no rain is expected until next week high pressures filling in it brings in that sort of northwest flow so expect colder air out there few stray clouds but a lot more sunshine tomorrow and some of those temps are all going to remain at or below average so look at this yesterday with that miserable weather you were 61 degrees we took it down to 45 today 16 degree drop there 45 tomorrow 43 on Wednesday, rainfall numbers are not out there. So let's pull up the extent the extended forecast. You can take a peek for yourself. Can we talk about how we're basically tranquil for the work week? Saturday, you're going to see some more clouds come into the area. Sunday, we thought we could be talking about some rain, but now it looks like it holds off until Monday. And across the board, your temperatures are, for the most part, 45 to 50 degrees. You see the coldest day there being Thursday at around 40 degrees. Uh, but it's cold. But it's calm. It's calm and fortunate it's calm tonight because those firefighters are in working a tough position yeah. working in Morris Heights. And we'll have yeah. more on that partial building collapse in just a minute.
You're looking at a live picture right now of Billingsley Terrace in the Morris Heights section of the Bronx, where as you can see, there's been a partial building collapse. As of now, firefighters report no injuries, but they are still searching the rubble, as they put it, searching for signs of life. Witnesses say there was some sound, some warning. The building shook just before the collapse, so some people were able to get out alive. Thanks for watching the News at 6. Live coverage of the partial collapse continues right now, streaming on CBS News New York. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell is next. Good night.
Thank you. Um, we're, we're here in the, in the Bronx, and I'm joined by uh, my local electors in the area, Bronx uh, uh, President uh, Gibson, uh, uh, District Attorney Clark, Assemblywoman Tapia, Councilwoman Sanchez, and also my agency heads are here as well. Uh, nice and Commissioner Isco will give us an overview of what happened and where the residents are. Uh, FDNY Commissioner Kavanaugh will give you the actions we're taking place right now on the scene and what the procedures are. And DOB Commissioner Otto will give the history of the building and if any uh, open violation. Uh, this incident took place approximately uh, 3.30 p.m. There was a partial collapse of a residential building here in Morris High section of the Bronx. Our first responders responded immediately and because of uh, video observation, we were able to have a preliminary review and communication with the owner of the store. Of our preliminary information with the owner of the store that everyone that was in the store is out at the time. The FDNY would give you an overview of exactly where we are, if there are any other people we believe. So I want to turn it over now to our nice commissioner, Commissioner Isco. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for being out here tonight. Uh, the building, we had a partial building collapse here at approximately 3.30 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Fire department units were on scene within a minute, 36 was their response time. And almost immediately we started the interagency process. So we brought out all of the utility companies to shut off power and gas to the building. We have Red Cross that is out here helping us to assist with individuals. NYPD is on the scene, keeping everybody safe, cordoning off the area. Buildings, HPD is doing their preliminary investigations into the partial building collapse. Uh, for residents of the building, we're directing them to a service center that we have set up at Public School 390, uh, just up the block. Uh, we will have a service center there. We also have the MTA out here with four warning, warming buses for residents who need it. Um, so there's a real collective effort that's taking place out here to serve the needs of the uh, people who live in this building and this community. Uh, as we go through this process. But again, any residents that need a place to stay tonight, please go to PS390. Uh, we will have teams there to help find you a place to stay uh, for the duration of this event. And now I'll turn it over to Commissioner Kavanaugh, who will discuss uh, some of the search and rescue operations and life safety part of this operation. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's really important to enforce that this is an ongoing operation. So our members behind me as we speak are still conducting search and rescue, and they will do so until we either find someone or confirm that there is no one under that rubble. So as Zach mentioned, our units were here were in under two minutes, and all of our specialized training and resources that we have for an incident like this have gone to work. We have our drone up surveying the area, seeing if we can find additional information about potential patients and areas of potential instability. We have our canine unit here helping us search for potential victims. And we have all of our special, specially trained firefighters, tactical units, collapse units, and our EMTs and rescue medics who are trained specifically to treat someone in a collapse. So this is an ongoing operation. I'd like to ask Chief Hodgins to add just a little bit to that. Um, but this is going to be ongoing for a few hours until we find someone or confirm that there is no one here. Good evening. As the commissioner stated, we arrived in one minute and 36 seconds. We immediately vacated, uh, evacuated the building, got all the residents out, and started to concentrate <laughs> on the uh, debris pile in front of the building, uh, working that and trying to search for any victims. We had dogs do searches, and at this time, we are, you know, that is our main objective, is to get to the bottom of that pile. We'll be here until it's we're down to the street level, just to make sure if there are any victims under there, hopefully we can get to them in time. But it's an ongoing operation. It's this type of operation we train for every day at our training facility. Um, our specialized units, we have a pile of debris at the rock and we, we train uh, exactly under these conditions for this day that hopefully doesn't happen too often.
this is a uh, 1927 building in seven stories. Any building that's higher than six stories falls within the jurisdiction of our facade law in New York City. Uh, these folks, the owner of this building, uh, submitted their most recent uh, report in March of 21. That report did find unsafe facade conditions, seven of them, uh, mortar that was deteriorating, cracked bricks. There is an active permit, a permit that's valid until uh, next summer. Work was being done on this building as recently uh, as a few days ago. I know you'll be interested in the history of the building in terms of violations. There are seven, uh, right now we see seven uh, open violations, five ECB, two DOB, but they are not structural violations. It has to do with the uh, sidewalk shed, the fact that it didn't have proper lighting, uh, et cetera. There are drawings that were submitted as part of the process to pull the permit that speaks to the part of the right lower corner that is collapsed. So obviously, we are, uh, will take a strong look at that. Uh, our engineers and our inspectors hope to be able, once given the green light from FDNY, to get in the, the building and the second part of the H building to do an inspection, and we'll have more answers uh, after that. We have a few questions. Folks, have questions, just let us know. We'll get to as many as we can. Go ahead. Uh, Mayor, so we spoke with several of the residents today who were on the street and they actually saw people, someone drilling into the facade of the side of this building, and then cracking, and then a few seconds later, the building starts to give way. I don't know if you or the commissioner can speak to what that drilling might have been, and what more can you tell us about that quadrant of the building that you were specifically looking at drawing? Yeah. Can't tell you much more. I certainly can't speak to what the drilling is. Don't know what it what it's about. Again, we're taking a look at the uh, the, the drawings that they submitted as part of the permit. And I want to be clear: unsafe facade conditions is not the same as an unsafe building. But uh, we are taking a good look at, at the paperwork, the drawings that they submitted, and we'll have some answers as soon as we have answers. Obviously, we'll share. With you. Was anybody working on the building? They, we don't believe that there were folks working on the facade work today. So far, as of now, we think the most recent work on the facade was several days ago. Okay, we we got other questions. Hey, folks, folks, I need you to raise your hand if you have questions so we know who's speaking. It's hard to hear. Go ahead. Yes, at, in the front of the building where the building the collapses, there's a large debris pile. And we don't know if anybody's trapped under there. Hopefully not. But what we're doing is we're tunneling in to that debris pile as safely as we can. Uh, firefighters right now are in a dangerous position. We don't know what caused this uh, corner of the building to come down. And we don't know if any more of it's going to come down. But we're searching for life, and that's our main objective at this time. I don't, I don't have any information on that work, so I can't really comment on it. Yeah, we have other questions. About how long will you, how long will you wait for reports of missing people until you determine that everything, everyone is accounted for? What is the timetable for this uh, There is no timetable. We will search the whole debris pile until every piece is picked up and we can see that they, whether there's anybody there or not. So many questions we have about this building. Our investigative reporter, Tim McNicholas, has been studying this for the past few hours. Uh, Tim, what have you found? Well, Dick, I, I know we reported that this building is more than 90 years old at this point, but I think we actually just got a photo of this building that was taken between 1939 and 1941. If we could show that, that would be great. I looked at the photo earlier, and it appears to be pretty similar to the way the building looks right now. There, not much has changed. There it is right there. So you can see that's pretty much what the building looks like today. And here's what we know so far. There were multiple permits just issued today related to sidewalk construction at that intersection. Some of those permits were for replacing the sidewalk and for the use of equipment, including a backhoe. So you can see there was some work happening there. 
But even though the permits were issued today, they aren't valid until the 30th. So what we don't know is whether that work to replace the sidewalk had already started, and if so, to what extent. We're also still looking into whether that contributed in any way to the collapse. The same questions apply to the seven open violations that were found at the property in Department of Buildings records. And in one of those violations from November of this year, an inspector wrote about a, a missing mud seal saying it could, quote, compromise the structural stability, causing a potential collapse, injuring pedestrians, damaging property. Now, the Department of Buildings commissioner just spoke, and he indicated that the violations, the open violations, are not structural in nature. What it might be is, is related to a sidewalk shed at the property. So we're still looking into that, and we're also still looking into other violations of the property. That one violation that I just mentioned, by the way, the mud seal, still listed as open with no compliance recorded. Uh, there are also some other issues in August, and there's still uh, complaints that have been filed over the past few months related to the construction, sifting through all that right now, Dick. And I have to say that some of the things we were listening to the Buildings Commissioner, they sounded almost counterintuitive. He said at one point uh, there were reports of an unsafe facade, but that doesn't mean the building was structurally unsound. And yet he also said that they were cracked, cracked bricks, too, uh, and that the seven violations were not structural. Did you find that all adding up in your head? Well, it seems like something we need to investigate. I'll tell you that right now. Those complaints of the unsafe facade, I believe they date back to about 2020. That's what I found in my notes and what I was looking into earlier. So have those records. We're still looking into them, and we've got a lot of questions to ask. Well, Tim Nick Nicholas, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, as you can tell, the story is still breaking. We're working to learn how this happened, what comes next for the people affected, and the search goes on for any survivors. Stay with us for continuing coverage streaming on CBS News New York and on the air on our late news at 11 p.m., and we will be right back. We continue to follow breaking news. This is the scene on Billingsley Terrace in Morris Heights of a partial building collapse. So far, at least, no reports of injuries, but firefighters are said to be still searching the pile for anyone who might be trapped at this point. There are no reports of injuries. Um, we've just gotten some video that we want to show you. It's of the collapse itself. Take a look. Whoa. Wow. There it goes in the background, and you can see in the foreground People were just walking. You see one person running from their car right beneath the collapse. And here, I guess you're seeing the, the mad scramble. This is another angle, a little closer, actually. 
and the cloud of dust that went bursting out and this gentleman so lucky to be getting out alive with that thing falling down basically right on top of him. You can see in the background too, there were people walking on the street where that building collapsed. So uh, let's hope, let's hope they did get out safely. And we will continue to cover this all evening long and stay with this as we get more information. Um, Lonnie, there has been some talk about the heavy rain last night because it was really intense and nobody knows what the cause of this collapse was, but there's always a thought that perhaps that something unstable can become mm -hmm. even more unstable. Look, New York City picked up about an inch and a half, a little bit over an inch and a half of rain. Now, portions of our area, I mean, saw five inches of rain, but in the city itself, in, in the area where the collapse took place, let's say between an inch and a half and two inches of rain. Uh, I, I'm not a structural engineer, so I can't tell you what that would do to a building. Uh, I'm gonna stay away from that, but that's what you had. Uh, and, and the winds also were not to the level to where they could do damage like that. Let me show you what we've got. Because yesterday, hey, you had bigger winds yesterday. You had rainfall. That storm is a memory. 41 degrees as of right now. The winds that we're looking at, all right, they're gonna continue to get weaker as you push through the late night hours tonight. Cooler temperatures for your day tomorrow all the way through Thursday and overall tranquil week that lies ahead. No rain is expected until next week. High pressure is filling in. It brings in that sort of northwest flow. So expect colder air out there. Few straight clouds, but a lot more sunshine tomorrow. And some of those temps are all going to remain at or below average. So look at this yesterday with that miserable weather. You were 61 degrees. We took it down to 45 today. 16 degree drop there. 45 tomorrow, 43 on Wednesday. Rainfall numbers are not out there. So let's pull up the, extent, the extended forecast. You can take a peek for yourself. Can we talk about how we're basically tranquil for the work week? Saturday, you're gonna see some more clouds coming to the area. Sunday, we thought we could be talking about some rain, but now it looks like it holds off until Monday. And across the board, your temperatures are, for the most part, 45 to 50 degrees. You see the coldest day there being Thursday at around 40 degrees. Uh, but it's cold, but it's calm. It's calm and fortunate it's calm tonight because those firefighters are in working a tough position night, yeah. working in Morris Heights.
This is CBS 2 News at 8. We had a partial building collapse here at approximately 3.30 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. This is weird. Like, to me, I'm scared. I don't even want to be in my own place. Right now at 8, the corner of a building crumbled to the ground after a partial collapse in the Bronx. Good evening. I'm Christine Johnson, and we begin with the latest on that breaking news out of the Bronx tonight. Here is what we know so far. Firefighters remain on the scene digging and sifting through rubble as part of the search and rescue process. So far, there have been no reports of victims or injuries, and we still do not know the cause. We have a team of reporters covering the story from every angle. Investigating reporter Tim McNicholas has a look at the building's history. Naveen Dhaliwal has information for displaced residents. Lisa Rosner has a look at how the neighborhood is reacting. And we begin with CBS 2's Jenna DeAngelis live at the scene with the latest. Jenna. Well, Christine, it's a shocking scene and a massive one. You can see the first responders behind me sifting through that big pile of rubble. So far, the FDNY says there are no reports of injuries, but they continue the search and will be out here until that work is done. Surveillance video shows people walking along the sidewalk when suddenly part of the building collapses and some start running for their lives. Police sources say the first call came in at 3.38 p.m. from a woman reporting she escaped the building. Several 911 calls followed. The FDNY says it responded to 172 West Burnside Avenue in a minute and 36 seconds. We immediately vacated, evacuated the building, got all the residents out. I started to concentrate on the uh, debris pile in front of the building, uh, working that and trying to search for any victims. From drones to canines and FDNY ladders, first responders are using all the resources needed in the search. We're tunneling in to that debris pile as safely as we can. Uh, firefighters right now are in a dangerous position. We don't know what caused this uh, corner of the building to come down, and we don't know if any more of it's going to come down. But we're searching for life, and that's our main objective at this time. Officials say utility companies were brought in to shut off power and gas in the building, which was evacuated. The collapse exposed people's homes. You can see a bed, clothing, appliances in the seven story building, which was built in 1927. The main floor is businesses. And because of uh, video observation, we were able to have a preliminary review and communication with the owner of the store of our. Preliminary information with the owner of the store that everyone that was in the store is out at the time. The FDNY says it has special training for incidents like this and they won't stop until they've reached the street below the rubble. It's really important to enforce that this is an ongoing operation. So our members behind me as we speak are still conducting search and rescue and they will do so until we either find someone or confirm that there is no one under that rubble. Giving you another live look at the scene. You know, I've been out here for hours and I still can't believe what we're looking at. I mean, this is the inside of people's apartments. And of course, once the FDNY finishes the search out here, the next step will figure will be figuring out how this happened. We're live in the Morris Heights section of the Bronx, Jenna DeAngelis, CBS 2 News. It is shocking, Jenna. Thank you. Let's go now to Lisa Rosner, who spoke to some witnesses tonight about what they saw. Lisa. Yeah, Christine, I'm told there are dozens of apartments in this building and six commercial businesses. I just got off the phone with the super who was home at the time. He was in another unit making repairs. He says his unit is actually one of the ones that you can see exposed on the side of the building here that look like they're on the verge of falling out onto the street. You can see in one unit a washer, dryer, and clothes. Witnesses tell us they heard a crack followed by people screaming and that was the alarm for them to run. They believe there were people working on the sidewalk shed at the time of the collapse, but the FDNY could not confirm that for us. The FDNY is still in a search and rescue op operation to see if anyone is trapped, but people in the neighborhood we spoke with missed this by seconds, either because they were walking by or they had just left the bodega that's on the ground level. Listen to what one of the witnesses had to say who was across the street as this unfolded. We also spoke with the Bronx Borough President we heard something like some people screaming across the street, so we go out to see what's going on. We see this construction stuff will start cracking, 
and then there was two guys doing some construction up there we see like a big rock start falling down <clears throat> Then the whole building just fell down in like a second. So I think about the working people that have to go to work tomorrow, the children that have to go to school tomorrow, right, and their lives are, are disrupted right now. Um, and so this is not new to us in the city and not new to us in the Bronx. And I think when you look at, you know, some of our buildings and the structural integrity and what we need to do when it comes to investments, new roof, new HVAC, making sure that our buildings can last for the next 100 years. And the building super tells me he believes everyone that was home did get out. Uh, the FDNY continues to search. They say they will not stop until they are certain that there is no one under the rubble. We are live in the Bronx. Lisa Rosner, CBS 2 News. We will continue to hope and pray for that, Lisa. Thank you. And we continue our team coverage of this collapse with CBS 2's Naveen Dhaliwal. She has some information on what impacted are being told tonight. Dozens of families who were living in the building are now displaced and the city along with the American Red Cross are helping them with shelter tonight. Officials have opened PS 390 just a few blocks away from the collapse site. They're receiving shelter, food and any other necessities. Some building tenants say they've had issues with their apartments deteriorating for a while now, including leaks. They say they saw the aftermath. They were in shock to see part of the apartment in rubble because of that residents who need Need a place to stay will remain here at the school or with family if they have so. As to when they'll be able to head back home, well, only time will tell. In Morse Heights, Naveen Dhaliwal, CBS 2 News. We have also been digging into the history of this building and the open violations at the property. CBS 2 investigative reporter Tim McNicholas in our newsroom with that part of the story. Tim. Christine, the property has seven open violations, according to the Department of Buildings. One of those is from March of 2021 related to hazardous conditions on the facade. The building is 96 years old and from this black and white picture we obtained, taken between 1939 and 1941, you can see not much has been updated on the outside of the building. The CBS2 investigative team found Google Street View images from November of last year that clearly show cracks in the facade. Water that was deteriorating, cracked bricks. There is an active permit, a permit that's valid until uh, next summer. Work was being done on this building as recently uh, as a few days ago. He says no work was being done on the facade today. CBS2 also dug into Department of Transportation records and found permits were issued today for sidewalk construction at the intersection where the collapse happened. The permits were to replace the sidewalk and to use construction equipment to do so, including a backhoe. While the permits were issued today, they are not valid until later this month, so it's not clear if that work had started in any capacity yet. The Buildings Department has not said whether that or the facade hazards could have contributed to the collapse. They did say that none of the open violations were for structural hazards. Christine. All right, Tim, thank you for that. We will continue to follow the breaking details in this story. We're working on right now to learn how this happened, what comes next for those all affected by this. Do stay with CBS 2 News for continuing coverage. We're streaming on CBS News New York. We'll also have an update tonight on CBS News at 11 o'clock. Well, there is other news making headlines across the tri-state tonight. Just ahead, the hunt is on for a suspect in the deadly hit and run crash in New Jersey. The latest details in the search and a big day from inside the courtroom. A key witness takes a stand in the assault trial against actor Jonathan Majors. What was said under oath?
We continue to follow some breaking news out of the Bronx where a building has partially collapsed. Right now, emergency responders are working to clear the rubble and search for any possible victims. There are currently no reports of any injuries. This happened around 3.30 this afternoon in Morris Heights, part of the seven-story apartment building on West Burnside Avenue and Pelham Place suddenly gave way. We will have continued to follow this story tonight and bring you the very latest updates at 11 o'clock. In the meantime, a rally was held at City Hall as officials questioned the need for Mayor Adams' budget cuts that affect public safety and quality of life. CBS2 political reporter Marsha Kramer says that city council members have suggestions for other ways to navigate these tough economic times. It was a stark reminder that the budget cuts Mayor Adams has ordered to help pay for the migrant crisis and to fill the gap left by the loss of federal pandemic funds are very, very, very unpopular. A rally by progressive council members and grassroots organizations seeking to reverse the cuts. It is completely untrue that we have to make these cuts right now. The rally came before a city council budget hearing into the need for belt tightening to deal with a $7 billion budget gap and the mayor's proposals that in the first round would cancel the next five police classes, reducing the NYPD headcount to 29,000, the lowest level since the 1990s, reducing manning on 20 fire companies and hit the sanitation department with many cuts, including fewer litter baskets on the street. Cutting every agency's budget indiscriminately will disproportionately impact everyday New Yorkers. The council issued a budget report that found an additional $1.2 billion in tax revenue while agreeing that the city does face difficult fiscal headwinds. Finance Chair Justin Brennan slamming the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, for not finding the funds. How can the public properly assess if the city needs to make these budget cuts when OMB is working on tax revenue projections that are essentially eight months old. We still have a gap of $7 billion to close in 37 days. The council suggesting other ways to find money, including using some of the city's budget reserves, collecting unpaid fees and fines, state and federal aid, and reviewing tax breaks, which are no longer necessary. The budget director said he would be happy to work with the council on the tax break issue, but he said that while it would help in the long run, it would not fill the present gaps. I'm Marcia Kramer, CBS 2 News. And the mayor is expected to ask agencies to come up with two more rounds of budget cuts, totaling 10 percent. Public libraries say that they are, are being hit especially hard and may be forced to cut service. Police continue to search for a suspect in a deadly car crash in New Jersey. This happened at the corner of Grand and Spring Streets in Elizabeth. Surveillance video shows the moment police say a Hyundai ran a red light and then crashed into a taxi head on Sunday morning. Cab driver Juan Carlos was killed. Family man, he loved his family, he loved his friends. Uh, you knew when he came in a room. Uh, at our wedding, I'll never forget him walking in. You knew he was right there and he was very excited. He loved my husband. He loved his family. Um, and we were hoping for him to meet our twins and he's not going to get that chance now. Police arrested two people in the Hyundai, but say that a third ran from the scene. And police also searching for two drivers in a deadly hit and run that happened in Queens. This accident happened Sunday night near Hempstead Avenue and 223rd Street in Queens Village. Police responding to the scene found a severely injured male lying in the roadway. Officers determined that he was crossing Hempstead Avenue when he was hit by a light colored sedan that left the scene. Police say a light colored SUV then hit the victim while he was on the ground and then drove off. The victim was pronounced dead at the scene. The domestic violence trial of actor Jonathan Majors resumed today. The man who drove Majors and his then girlfriend, Grace Jabari, the night of their alleged fight took the stand. Jabari accuses the actor of hitting her during an argument in the back seat of the chauffeured car back in March. Now, the driver, who spoke through an interpreter, said Jabari got angry over text messages. He said that he thinks he remembers seeing Jabari hit Majors. Majors has pleaded not guilty. 
The nighttime hours are bringing a dip in the temperatures, that's for sure. You can feel it. Here is Lonnie with our first alert forecast. Lonnie? Yes, yeah, such a change from yesterday, even though, all right, yesterday was miserable weather. You still had a high temperature yesterday of 61 degrees. Very different setup right now. Now, we had cloud cover, but you can see the clouds are breaking up. It'll be a sunnier day for you tomorrow. And really, yesterday's storm is a memory, but not necessarily a good memory. A lot of rain, right? I mean, look at this. Fort Salonga. Picked up over five inches of rain. North Massapequa, almost five inches, 4.8. Sheldon, Connecticut, 3.6. Bradley Beach, New Jersey, 3.4. Central Park, officially 1.67. So a lot of rain for everybody. In terms of snow totals, and yes, on the back side of all that rain, the temperatures did crash in some areas. Granted, they were high elevated spots north and west of the city. High Point, New Jersey, at around 2,000 feet of elevation, picked up 5.1 inches of snow. Kayamisha, Sullivan County, 2.5 inches. Green Pond, New Jersey, 1.7. And Wattis Township picked up half an inch of snow. The winds were a part of the story as well. The biggest wind we found on the Jersey Shore, a 59 mile per hour gust in Keyport, Harvey Cedars 45, Beach Haven, New Jersey 41. The winds were not as strong as suspected, uh, as suspected that they would be out on Long Island. LaGuardia had a 40 mile per hour gust, Central Park 28, but yeah, New Jersey with the biggest winds of all. And the winds have been backing down as the day has progressed today, but they're still kind of gusty out there. We just recorded a 38 mile per hour gust in White Plains, a 31 at J. JFK, a 21 mile per hour gust in Greenwich, Connecticut. They're going to continue to weaken, but they don't go away entirely. So, yes, they get weaker during the overnight hours. It's a cool day, sort of tomorrow, and for Wednesday and for Thursday as well. Overall, it's tranquil, however. No rain expected until sometime next week. So, the high pressure is going to fill in, gives you a dry pattern, but again, with a northwest wind, it is cold out there, temperatures at or below average. So, yesterday, like I said, 61. We crossed you down by 16 degrees today to 45. You're 45 Tuesday. 43 on Wednesday. Rain chances? Nope. I do not see them. So let's pull up the seven day forecast, KJ, and we'll chat about it for a little bit. 43 tomorrow, 43 Wednesday, 40 Thursday. Now, I will say Thursday is the coldest day of the bunch there. Friday, you're 48. And then by Saturday and Sunday, we're looking at a few more clouds overhead. The rain chance, though, we thought we might see it for Sunday. It now looks like it waits until Monday. So, all in all, like I said, pretty tranquil out there. It's definitely colder than it was over oh, the yeah. weekend. But, uh, you know, when you consider the two, I'll sure. take the colder air with a calmer, a calmer atmosphere. Definitely. Me too. Thank you, Lonnie. Okay, you bet. Let's go over to Otis now with what's coming up in sports. Zach Wilson was marvelous yesterday. We'll see if Tommy DeVito can be the same tonight in his Monday night football debut. And why was Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes so happy, so mad yesterday? The two-time MVP thought his team got robbed, but I'll show you how his anger was misdirected coming up after the break.
This is CBS Sports New York, presented by Ford. Well, to say it's a big night at the Meadowlands is an understatement. I and think for see one a, New Jersey boy. I was right? about to say, you're going to see a lot of this out at the MetLife Stadium. The legend of Tommy Cutlets reaching a national level tonight. The Jersey boy Tommy DeVito made his Monday night debut against the Packers tonight. The Don Bosco prep product is trying to make it three wins in his first four starts. Awesome opportunity. I'm um, looking forward to it. It's like any other game except on a Monday night, right? But, um, yeah, it's an op awesome opportunity to be the only game on and just enjoy and go play football. And for those of you who are trying to bury Zach Wilson ending his Jets career, put those shovels away. Shame on you. Zach is very much alive, at least for this week. The three times benched, one time franchise quarterback came up big against the Houston Texans yesterday. Zach vowed to let it rip and have some fun out there. And he certainly did that, showing off that arm talent that Jets fans fell in love with him when the team drafted him number two overall in 2021. He threw for 301 yards, two touchdowns in the Jets' 30-6 to route of the Texans. His cornerback, DJ Reed, said in the locker room before the game, Zach told him he's playing for them. He has nothing to lose. What's the worst that can happen? He gets benched again, and then he went out and had a career game. In three years where it's been challenging, obviously. Um, but I think it's focusing on the, on the ones that truly matter. Keeping my circle tight. Um, understanding that the guys that truly matter the ones in there battling going through it with me and I play this game because I love to compete I love to play I love the thrill of making the big throws and, and winning football games and you know that's truly the reason I play this game and you know it's it, it's exciting um, when you're able to do that as a unit you know and it's easy to ignore all of the noise when when you're able to go and do that stuff Got to feel good for that young man. All right, Dodgers make a deal with the Yankees to free up a spot for Shohei Otani, trading reliever Victor Gonzalez and infielder Jorvit Vivas for or shortstop prospect Trey Sweeney. The Knicks are in action at the Garden tonight against Toronto, but Mitchell Robinson isn't there. In fact, he's expected to miss at least eight weeks after undergoing surgery on his left ankle. He suffered the injury Friday against the Celtics. Robinson is averaging a team-high 10.3 rebounds a game and 1.3 blocks in the Knicks' 21 games this season. Controversy in the NFL last night. Patrick Mahomes was fired up at the officials because they called an offsize penalty against his wide receiver, the former giant Kadarius Toney. Good call, but it did rob us of what could have been one of the greatest plays in history. Travis Kelsey with the lateral back to who else? Toney for the go-ahead TD against the Bills. Instead, offsides. You can see it plainly. The Bills would win it 20 to 17. Ugh. Good call, though. Like this much. Yeah. Missed it this by much. <laughs> that much. Wow. Yeah. It's a game of inches. Now, say. are they freewheeling out there when Kelsey, Kelsey does Yeah, he it? just did that. <laughs> Spontaneous. <laughs> Saw him coming up from, from that side and just threw it to him. It looked like it was a great design play, but it wasn't. It was something that he thought up on the, fl on the fly. And, of course, Kadarius Tony, who was offside, got him. the touchdown. He was like, yeah. Nope, bring it back. And they ended up losing to the Buffalo that Bills. That one hurts. Yeah, a that lot. And you don't see Patrick Mahomes go off as much. Uh, I think he, he, they said that he was offsides. Mm -hmm. They felt that he was offsides, mm -hmm. but it had nothing to do with the play, so why make that call? But you have to. That's what it's about. You're right. Yeah. You're right. If you the rules are in the books, the you got to go by the rules. Yeah. yeah I agree. Yep. That one hurts. Yeah, the, the Bills, it Ouch. didn't hurt as bad for the Bills. No, no, no they loved no. it. <laughs> loving it. <laughs> Think so. Well, hey, look at this. You look don't see this. this every day. More than 300 skiing Santas take to the slopes at Sunday River Ski Resort in Maine, part of an annual fundraising event where more than $8,000 was raised for a scholarship fund program. That's always nice. nice. Lots of snow up there already. No, Santa loves the snow. Yes, oh, he yeah. does. Big fan. Many reindeer, too. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We'll be back here at 11 o'clock. Have a good night.